Good morning. Welcome to today's hearing, which is a continuation of the Land Injustice Hearing Block 6. Um, I would like to invite Commissioner Hunter to give the welcome to country, please. Thank you, Chair. So I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are on the lands of the Rundry, pay my respects to Elders, past and present. Uh, acknowledge all those that have come before us to give us voice here today. Um, and as I say, most of my welcomes, woman Jekka means to come with purpose, and I hope that's what um, happens today. So woman Jekka, and welcome to the lands of the Rundry. Commissioner Hunter, may we have appearances, please? Ms. McLeod. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is McLeod. I appear with Mr. Tony McAvoy this afternoon, um, this afternoon's witness, and Ms. Weinberg this morning to assist you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Hunter, for your welcome. We acknowledge this hearing today is uh, proceeding on the lands of the Wurundjeri. We acknowledge elders and ancestors and their ongoing fight for justice. Thank you. I appear for the State of Victoria and for Minister D'Ambrosio today with my learned junior, Mr McDermott. Thank you, Commissioner Hunter. You're welcome. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today, the Wurundjeri people. We pay our deep respect to Elders past and present, but we also extend those respects <coughs> to other First Peoples who are present today or otherwise watching online. We acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded, and we continue to come with purpose. Thank you. Mm. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. If the Commission pleases, I now call today's first witness, the Honourable Lily D'Ambrosio, uh, MP, Minister for Climate Action and Energy and Resources. Thank you. Welcome, Minister. Welcome. Uh, Minister, could you please tell the Commission your full name? My full name is Liliana D'Ambrosio. Minister, you hold the positions of Minister for Energy and Resources, Minister for Climate Action and Minister for the State Electricity Commission, correct? That's correct, yes. Do you undertake to give truthful evidence to this commission to the best of your knowledge? I do. Minister, you prepared a witness statement dated 8 March 2024, correct? Yes, that's correct. And are the contents of that statement true and correct? They are correct. Commission pleases, I tender that uh, statement at this time. Minister, you are the coordinating minister of the department, DECA, which also has also submitted a response to requests for information from the commissioner. Uh, from the commission, have you read that response? I have. I also tender that document. Uh, thank you, Chair. Minister, I understand you want to make an opening statement to the Commission. Please yes. go ahead. Thank you so much and thank you. I make this statement to complement my witness statement and I do so in order to provide more personal reflections to the Commission about self-determination and I do this uh, with purpose. Uh, thank you to Commissioner Hunter for the welcome to country this morning. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of, of the land upon which this important work is being undertaken the land of the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respect to their elders past and present. I want to acknowledge the elders in this room, their leadership, their courage, and their knowledge. I want to acknowledge all First Peoples who have been heard by the Commission. I also would like to acknowledge the work of the Commission and the Commissioners who have led this truth-telling process into historical and ongoing injustices experienced by First Peoples in Victoria. I was born in 1964, which meant that I was assured of a right to vote in adulthood, unlike Aboriginal adults, and that my life expectancy would be far greater than that of Aboriginal children of the same age, and that my pathway to an education was well lit and clear because I had good, secure housing and family connections, unlike that of many Aboriginal children of similar age. As teenagers, my friends and I were off, too often preoccupied by discussions of our own identity, when we should have understood better that we were really the fortunate ones. I failed to understand that for First Peoples, they knew who they were. They were the First Peoples. They knew that they belonged to the land and the land belonged to them as custodians. They had their own laws and systems, but our laws, the laws that I inherited and which favoured me, 
formally nullified Aboriginal laws and took away their land, took away their self-determination, their livelihoods, stewardship of their land, their health and well-being, and tore families apart. Who benefited? I and my generation did, and the generations before me and those since. I recognise that I am privileged to be an elected member of parliament. Further, I am a long-standing member and have seen and been involved in parliamentary and government decision-making since 2002. I've held several portfolios since 2014, including resources, climate action, energy, industry and environment. I acknowledge and take responsibility for the fact that change towards self-determination has been too slow. Whilst many positive changes have been made, nowhere near enough has been done for First Peoples to be able to claim we are nearly there. Bigger steps must be taken and sooner. I take responsibility for my role as an elected member and minister during this period and commit to the Commission today that I will work harder and do more, all that I can to enable First Peoples to affect self-determination, to repair the enduring damage of dispossession so they themselves can shape and decide their futures. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister, for that statement. Um, could we please bring up your witness statement, uh, which appears, I believe, uh, in the, behind tab one of your folder? I could have that brought up on the screen at paragraph 14. Um, so, Minister, you've uh, made a number of acknowledgements and uh, expressed recognition of various things in your opening remarks. Can I invite you to read out also this paragraph 14? I read the following. I am mindful of the impact that the work of government in relation to the energy and resources and climate action portfolios for which I am responsible has on country and on culture and in turn on the spiritual, emotional and physical well-being of First Peoples. I've reflected on the significant responsibility I carry to listen to the voices of First Peoples, which have echoed across the generations in speaking about what country means to them, both in the past, now and for their future. Throughout my years as Minister, I've witnessed how institutional Western culture embedded systems of government have stood as barriers to self-determination barriers which have existed for more than 200 years. I have immense respect for how resilient First Peoples are and have had to be in their continuing advocacy for their rights, recognition and for change. Thank you. Can I invite you to turn to page 5 and paragraph 21? That brought up on the screen. And invite you to read paragraph 21 and 22. My commitment to First Peoples' self-determination also reflects my personal and heartfelt acknowledgement of the devastating intergenerational consequences of the dispossession of First Peoples of and from their country. This dispossession has had destructive effects on culture, including cultural practices, language, and the important responsibility to connect with and care for country. It has also upset the important balances between First Peoples and their traditional country. I acknowledge that these consequences are a direct result of colonisation and the establishment of the state of Victoria, I'm, I apologise, the establishment of the state of Victoria and its successive laws, policies and practices. The reality of horrific violence and state-sanctioned systemic disposition of country and destruction of culture are truths which must be told. And these truths should continue to be told through the work of the Commission and beyond. This history and the systems that caused it continue to harm First Peoples today. As a Minister of the State, I am responsible to effect the systemic changes necessary to address these effects. Thank you, Minister. Um, can I just pause there and ask you, uh, I take it you accept that disposition from lands, as we've heard in this Commission, was at the time unlawful? Yes. Um, and that the destructive effects of that dispossession include dispossession from the right to uh, live on and use resources associated with the land. Yes. And I invite you to turn to paragraph 44.
page 10. Um, and would you read 44, please? I also acknowledge that certain legislation retains legacies of legal frameworks from colonial times and is therefore informed by outdated and paternalistic assumptions about First Peoples' culture and rights that reflect English legal concepts. For example, whilst ownership of gold has been proclaimed to be the property of and subject to control by the Crown by Lieutenant Governor Latrobe on August the 16th, 1851, legislation governing royalties, mines and minerals was put in place by the English Parliament in 1855 and minerals other than gold were the subject of state control through legislation passed in 1860. These remain our resources, sorry, these remain our resource legal and policy frameworks to this day. For example, as is reflected in the Mineral Resources Sustainable Development Act 1990, Victoria. And 47, please. The legacy of the colonial structures I outlined above continue today. The state of Victoria continues to maintain ownership of Victoria's minerals and petroleum until the resource is lawfully removed from the land under a licence, lease, permit or authority to explore for, mine or otherwise extract the resource, with royalties paid to the state on resources extracted. There are also several statutory powers that I may, that I may be called upon to exercise as Minister with responsibilities under such legislation relating to the grant or the refusal to grant different types of licences, declarations or exemptions for mining exploration, development and retention. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister. I just want to take a little moment now to consider the historical rights and legislative framework for the use of resources and those uh, matters that are within your portfolio responsibility. You've made some statements today about the history of this state. And as I mentioned, Uruk has heard evidence about the unlawful actions of squatters, possession of lands prior to statehood, and the Crown assertion of title to those lands as a mechanism to maintain squatters' claims to land. Um, I want to explore those topics within your portfolio responsibilities. And um, you wanted to, I think, point out paragraph 41 and 42 of your statement. We can go back on the screen, please, to paragraph 41 and 42. <clears throat> Would you read paragraph 41 for us, please? I acknowledge that the legal reality of British sovereignty was the state-sanctioned dispossession of First Peoples' land and waters on a devastating scale. The dispossession was fuelled in large part by the quest for wealth in the form of what the colonial state conceptualised as resources for the creation of wealth, including gold and other metals and minerals and rich pastures to enable large-scale agriculture, including wool production. History shows that these were viewed as riches for easy exploitation by the settlers and the colonising state alike and were treated as such in accordance with the imported English legal systems and processes. And 42. In these ways, it is clear to me that First Peoples were dispossessed of all resources which were considered of value in the colony by the same legal concepts and frameworks which enabled them to be dispossessed of their traditional lands. And then can I invite you to read the reflection you set out at paragraph 46? I have reflected on this history and the legacy I carry and can see that for Victoria to move into a more just and equitable future, we must address the ongoing nature of dispossession and the injustices that this continues to perpetrate. Minister, do you accept that... Perpetuate? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, did you read perpetuate? Yes. Uh, shall I read the... Yeah, your statement uh, finishes perpetuate rather than perpetrate. Oh, I apologise. Uh, that's okay. Oh, sorry. No. I, I will read that again. Sorry, yes, please. May. Thank you. I've reflected on this history and the legacy I carry and can see that for Victoria to move into a more just and equitable future, we must address the ongoing nature of dispossession and the injustices that this continues to perpetrate. 
perpetuate. My apologies again. Thank you, Minister. Uh, so, Minister, just pausing there, you accept that Victoria's wealth today depends on our historical seizure of lands and particularly for sheep farming? Absolutely. And historical extraction of resources, particularly gold in this state. And that there has never been an accounting for lands taken unlawfully from our First Peoples? That's correct. Likewise, there's never been an accounting for wealth associated with the resources taken from those lands. Yes. Do you accept that these facts compel governments to secure the economic prosperity of First Nations people from these resources? Can you just repeat that? Sure. Do you accept that these facts compel governments, the governments of Victoria, successive governments, to secure the economic prosperity of First Nations people from these resources, lands and other resources associated with lands. Yes. Over the centuries, Minister, um, turning back to this historical framework, over the centuries, can you tell the Commission, please, which minerals have been the principal resources exploited within Victoria? Uh, yes. Uh there have been uh, several minerals uh, and resources uh, that have been exploited uh, in Victoria. Primarily, they have been gold and coal, petroleum, that is oil and gas, extractive minerals from quarries on Crown land, yes. uh, including sand, stone and gravel. Uh, other minerals have included antimony, base metals and mineral sands. And certainly we have also had geological storage for petroleum and carbon dioxide. Come back to carbon dioxide in the context of cl climate change in a moment. But the principle of those are gold and coal in terms of value. Accepted? Uh, yes. Now, um, just want to take you back to the discovery of gold at the time of statehood and ask you to explain how historically the exploitation of minerals and resources within Victoria dispossessed First Peoples of their access to those resources? Certainly the discovery of gold uh, in 1851 uh, 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 triggered uh, reactions from uh, the colony at the time uh, for the uh, very fast, uh, rapid exploitation of the resource. Uh, and. Uh, Victorian government uh, began offering uh, rewards uh, for anyone who found gold within uh, pro certain proximity of Melbourne, 320 kilometres. And over a six-month period, gold was discovered uh, in the key areas of Clunes, Ballarat, Castlemaine and Bendigo. And these areas, of course, were the countries of Wadarong, Jara, Jajawarung and Tangarung and uh, Tangarung countries. In fact, rewards were offered uh, in the order of £200 uh, and that uh, commenced uh, a massive uh, pushing of traditional owners from their land in order to uh, exploit these resources. So just to ex understand that £200 reward in 1851 was a huge sum of money. It was probably a king's ransom, yes. And that reward that was offered enticed people of all skill sets, all professions, to leave work in the centres, uh, city centres, developing at that time, and move on to those countries in search of gold. Yes, and in fact, uh, I think it did also lead to uh, a massive uh, um, immigration wave uh, to, to the colony at the time. Uh, yes, I would agree with that. At that time, how was gold uh, managed in terms of the ownership? Well, certainly not uh, very well. I mean, it was a very uh, unregulated uh, system at the time where effectively uh, inducements were, were were offered by the state uh, and uh, individuals uh, were uh, encouraged to uh, explore for gold uh, without any mindfulness whatsoever uh, in terms of the land, uh, the ownership of the land uh, that was mm. to be exploited. Mm. Uh, now, at the time, um, in terms of uh, how the resources were uh, understood uh, or, or regulated, 
uh, ownership of gold was proclaimed to be the property of and the subject of control uh, by the state, the Crown, I should say. And uh, over a period of time, legislation was put in place uh, in 1855 by the British Parliament that governed the management and control of Crown land in Victoria, including royalties, mines and minerals. Uh, and how else were those minerals, other than gold, subject to state control? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the use and the gathering of minerals, uh, other than gold, were subject to state control uh, through legislation that was passed in 1860. And this enabled leases of Crown land for mining any mineral except gold, which included uh, live or dead timber, gravel, stone, limestone, salt, guano, shell, seaweed, sand, loam or brick earth not exceeding seven years. But uh, as I said, gold was exempted from that. Um, so there's a footnote in your statement to this legislation, but just for Commissioner's benefit, the 1855 legislation governing the management and control of Crown land in Victoria, including royalties, mines and minerals that you've mentioned, which dealt with gold, was an act to enable Her Majesty to assent to a bill as amended of the Legislature of Victoria to establish a constitution in and for the colony of Victoria, 16 July 1855. And uh, so that's an imperial act. Mm. And then in 1860, an act regulating the sale of Crown lands and for other purposes, 18 September 1860, just for the record. Both of those were imperial acts. Uh, recognising that uh, Victoria was a colony of uh, the imperial government at the time. Yes. Uh, now, what happened in 1891 in terms of ownership of land above and below the surface? Until 1891, uh, consistent with British common law, ownership of land including all that lay above and below the surface, excluding gold and silver, uh, which can continued to be reserved in the Crown. In 1891, uh, that changed. The colonies, from that date, 1891, the colonies deviated from English common law by legislating to give the Crown enduring property uh, in or right to any metal or minerals in or under the land, irrespective of ownership of the land, increasing and strengthening the Victorian legislature's ownership and wealth derived from mineral resources. Now, just to be sure, um, I assume there was no uh, negotiation with First Peoples in relation to those assertion of ownerships. That's correct. Those, those two pieces of legislation. Okay. Now, coming to the estimated amount and value of gold removed from the gold fields in current day terms, are you able to tell the Commission, give, a, give us a number of the the volume of gold extracted since 1851 from Victorian lands. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And and uh, to that point, gold continues to be extracted uh, in Victoria. To date, uh, more than 2,400 tonnes has been extracted in Victoria, so beginning from 1851. The value of that in today's terms uh, of all of that, this uh, the value based on weight to the current spot price of gold of a, is about $287.4 billion. So $287.4 billion worth of gold, uh, presumably benefiting all Victorians through state assertion of ownership, but there has never been an accounting for that wealth uh, for First Nations people, has there? That's correct. So what happened to that wealth? Where was it transferred? The wealth effectively uh, of gold, uh, there were no royalties that were payable uh, to the state uh, from gold extraction up until 2020. Uh, so during all of that period from 1851 until 2020, uh, the wealth of that gold was transferred to individuals who mined it. And then the economy depended on their spending it wherever they spent it. Absolutely, that's correct. And uh, uh, we, we we know that uh, with the uh, the finding of gold, 
uh, and therefore its extraction and the wealth that came from that. Uh, there was a, a great boom in, in building construction and, and the broader wealth throughout the economy that uh, all, uh, all people benefited from at the time, uh, but certainly uh, traditional owners were not included. Just in terms of how the state benefited from the extraction of that gold, you said that there were no royalties. When, when were royalties introduced on gold? Only very recently, uh, in 2020, uh, were royalties imposed on gold extraction. Um, so state revenues prior to that time were indirect through various taxes and there the is, issuing of licences. Absolutely, thank you. Yes, certainly uh, with the wealth extracted and uh, and claimed by individuals, uh, of course that wealth circulates, circulated through the economy and uh, government was able to extract uh, benefit uh, indirectly through uh, taxation uh, and certainly of uh, permissioning regime that existed at the time. And certainly the income derived from licences was historically controversial, for example, leading to the Eureka Stockade in Victoria. That's correct. But nevertheless, the state continued to benefit from the payment of licence fees where those licence fees were paid. Precisely. So royalties since 2020, what's the regime now? So I'm still asking you about where the wealth was transferred and the various um, aspects of the legal framework for royalties for gold. Minister, we're talking about the historic rights and legislative framework still? Yes. And under that history, I was asking you about estimated amount and value of gold and then to where was wealth transferred? Yes, you, you, you're asking for uh, the royalties since 2020, is that yes. right? Yes. So royalties uh, from 2020 and ongoing – uh, royalties uh, go to the state uh, in consolidated revenue. The royalties since 2020, um, is my understanding correct, that they are not paid on the first 2,500 ounces that a licensee produces in a single year? Yes, that's correct. Yes, uh, that, that is the threshold for uh, royalties to be paid. It has to reach that threshold. And I don't have the spot price of gold available to my hand, but is that also, and when we can check that number, but is that also a considerable sum in today's terms? Well, uh, yes, and uh, if you like, I'm, I'm uh, happy to provide some uh, information about how much has been collected by the state since the royalty on gold was introduced in 2020. Uh, to uh, so so since the royalty was introduced in 2020, 149.4 million dollars in royalties from gold has been received by the state. Okay, um, so just to stay with that figure for a moment, the licensee obtains the total benefit of the first two and a half thousand ounces of gold extracted each year, and that. Uh, is a policy position to reflect the risk-reward ratio for those seeking to extract gold from country? Uh, yes, that, that's correct. Um, you, you would uh, imagine that uh, in 2020 and leading up to that date, there was uh, views taken within government, uh, I suppose that, that typical word that we use around balancing interests and risks, uh, and that it was struck, it was deemed by government that uh, that was the right um, point from which royalties could be uh, applied. And that reflects the historical position that there was encouragement of individuals to take up the risk of mining and investment uh, in their mining activities in order to reward the state generally. That's correct. Okay. Uh, but none of that, uh, that sum, either the two and a half thousand ounces 
is directed towards First Nations or anything above that. That's correct. By way of royalties. That's correct. First Nations peoples do not benefit in any direct way from royalties acquired from the extraction of gold, do they? That's correct. So in a brief, uh, could you just give us a brief overview for the legal framework for royalties for gold and the acts that I think you just started to mention? First is the Mineral Resources Sustainable Development Act 1990. Yes, uh, there are uh, several uh, laws or acts uh, that govern uh, broadly the exploration of, exploration of mining and mineral resources and including gold, and they are the Mineral Resources Sustainable Development Act of 1990, Mineral Resources Sustainable Development Mineral Industries Regulations of 2019, and Mineral Resources Sustainable Development Extractive Industries Regulations of 2019. And uh, that 2019 regulate those 2019 regulations provide for the calculation of royalties for gold uh, currently at the rate of 2.75 percent of the net market value of gold produced under the license. Correct. And as you've mentioned, the first two and a half thousand ounces exclusion is set out in those regulations. Correct. Royalties for gold are generally payable in respect of each financial year. Is that correct? Yes. Unless a notice is issued requiring some different period. That's correct. Okay. Now, um, in terms of that regulation, are you aware of what prompted these um, acts to, and regulations to be introduced and to be known as sustainable development uh, legislation and regulations? Are you aware of that history or? The history for the naming of, yes. of these instruments? Yes. Uh, well, um, uh, There's a question uh, without notice, so I apologise. <laughs> yes, no, I, I appreciate that. Uh, look, um, I suppose uh, naming of legislation and regulatory instruments can serve a number of purposes. One is that they can effectively be what they say they are in terms of a name. Uh, in other respects, it is also potentially to give assurance that sustain that these these uh, these activities are, do are done in this case in a sustainable way. Um, so sustainable meaning that they will be available for future generations? That, is, that could potentially be one interpretation of that, but it, yes, definitely. Okay. Now, I'm just checking you're a member of government, an executive member of government at the time these acts were passed, but you may not have had portfolio responsibility for those acts, is that? Uh, that that's correct, not in those periods. Okay. Now, in terms of depth limitations of the grants of freehold titles, what is the situation um, – I'll ask you this and then just ask you whether I'm correct. Land titles created before 1891 – we're still on the history piece. Yes. Um, um, haven't come to the current day yet. I'm just asking about depth limitations on grants of freeholds. Land titles created before 1891 are unlimited in depth and apparently extend to the centre of the earth. Correct? Correct. So if we had the technology, or whoever had the technology technically has the ability to extract an unlimited, uh, except by the dimensions of the globe. Six, yes. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Land titles created after 1891 are subject to what limitation? Is it 50 feet? I am looking for my detail, but I believe that that is the case. Okay. So previously unlimited down to the centre of the earth for all those titles that persist uh, today that were created before 1891, since 1891, land beneath land titles is considered crown land below 50 feet. Yes. Or 15 metres, roughly. So coming today to the state of Victoria's uh, continued assertion of ownership of minerals and petroleum, can we come to today? Minerals and resources, am I correct, remain the property of the state until those resources are lawfully extracted. Correct. And... I think you mentioned in your opening uh, paragraphs that the extraction of those resources is done 
via a license or a permit or a, a lease or authority to explore in the first place and then to extract the resource. That's correct, yes. And a fee might be paid for exploration, but a uh, royalty is paid based on extraction volumes. Correct. And the mechanism for setting those royalties depend on what is being extracted and their value. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Can we come to the minerals and resources sectors generally? The Just to cap, uh, catch up, the Crown has asserted ownership of all minerals since colonisation, correct? Yes. And uh, resources uh, vested in soils and stones have been vested with private landholders or the Crown for Crown land. Yes. So if squatters took possession illegally of lands, at some point in time, the assumption was that they also had title back in 1851, for example, to the core of the earth for all those resources below their lands. Correct. We'll come to water later, but do you know whether that also applies to water, subject to current regulations for water? Uh, look, no, I'm, I'm not aware of that, but uh, happy to find that information if, if needed. That's okay. We'll come back to that with the Water Minister. The state authorises licensees to access those resources and in turn those licensees pay royalties to the state, as I've said, based on what's extracted, mm -hmm. correct? In other words, the economic benefit derived by the state to the exclusion of First Peoples from these resources generally has been significant in the realm of billions of dollars. Yes. And um, you've mentioned the legislative framework for mining of mineral resources, those Mineral Resources Sustainable Development Acts and regulations. In terms of um, the exploration, mining and quarrying of um, what's known as earth resources. Is there a regulator who oversees that activity? Yes, there is. Uh, within uh, Resources Victoria, uh, which is located in the DECA, uh, there is uh, the earth, uh, sorry, the resources regulator. Um, more than 5,000 licences have been granted under the minerals legislative regime, is that correct? That's correct. And to your knowledge, approximately 40% of Victoria is the subject of exploration licences. Yes. So people may not know this, but their properties, which they think they hold in freehold or freehold properties, absolutely, may be the subject of exploration rights by third parties. Yes. And those exploration rights, rights allow people to enter land and explore. Yes, that's correct. And then subject to later approvals to extract resources regardless of those freehold titles. Uh, that's correct. Uh, th there are, if you like, um, uh, requirements for consultation, engagement before someone can just, you know, just exercise to enter someone's land, but certainly that is generally speaking correct. And the engagement and consultation that is required is with freehold owners, not right. First Nations owners. That's correct. Aboriginal title or recognition of Aboriginal connection to country is not something that has to be considered when uh, allowing exploration or extraction of resources. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Certainly under the regulatory system that we have, that's correct. Not required by those. Just want to come to some numbers in terms of volume of production and revenue generated. Do you have those numbers, Andy? <clears throat> Excuse me. I I, uh, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so total royalties paid to the state for mineral, stone and petroleum resources since 2010. These are some numbers that your office has provided. Uh, sorry, your department has provided to us. Those royalties since 2010, amount to more than $1 billion, correct? Correct. Can you give us the number of royalties from gold since gold royalty was introduced uh, some three and a bit years ago? Certainly. Uh, so for, for in terms of royalties uh, received from the extraction of gold, uh, $149.4 million. So in a period of three and a bit years, $149.4 million of royalties going to the state? Yes. 
in terms of royalties from other minerals, including coal, for that period? Uh, for coal, royalties have been received in the order of $885.6 million. Um, and is... Oh, the apologies. That that includes... Well, it, it's categorised as other minerals, but primarily it is coal. Uh, and royalties from sandstone and gravel on Crown land? Uh, $79.5 million in royalties. Um, uh, the note from the department mentions that extraction from Crown land... Are there royalties paid from sandstone and gravel extraction on private land? Uh, I will I, I will seek confirmation of, of that if I may. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I won't. I don't know the answer to that straight off. Okay. Royalties collected by the state for all of oh, these. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No, no. Please continue. Sorry. If you had an answer, please interrupt I, I me. I thought I did, but okay. I, I didn't. I'm sorry. Royalties collected by the state from each of these activities go into consolidated revenue, correct? That's correct. And they provide for various state-funded activities in accordance with the budget process. Exactly. Now, we have a table that the department has provided in relation to the production volumes over the same period. Volumes, can you just give us the number for gold in terms of the production uh, units? Thank you. Uh, Yes, uh, the production uh, units of gold uh, were 4,555,572 ounces. Or silver? 71,039 ounces. Or antimony? 36,421 tonnes. Or mineral sands? 3,448,844 tonnes. Commissioners, please, we'll get you this table. Uh, for industrial min minerals? 9,463,593 tonnes. For coal? 482,485,000 th tonnes. And for all other commodities? 75,351 tonnes. Um, extractives, uh, th th they would be, uh, sorry, yes, 802 million tonnes. And condensate produced? 1,064,538 condensate, condensate barrels, in other words. Okay, now just turning to gas, uh, gas is obviously extracted from Victorian lands. Yes. Can you give us the numbers for gas produced and injected? Yes, thank you. Uh, gas produce is 145,033 million standard cubic feet. And, uh, and yes. And injected, is that? Yes. Yes. 159,346 million standard cubic feet. What is injected? Gas injected. Mm -hmm. I uh, I am not aware of that. Uh, I'm sorry, but um, can we come back I, to that after the break? Yes, I'm happy to yep. come back. Thank you. Um, and likewise, the CO2 production. Yes, four hundred and forty-six thousand and twelve tons. Um. So just on that, what is the status of fracking as an extraction technique in Victoria? Uh, fracking is not permissible. Uh, According to the Constitution of Victoria, uh, fracking uh, was banned in Victoria in 2017 uh, and in 2021, uh, the Constitution Amendment Fracking Ban Bill of 2020, which was when it was introduced, was passed and uh, that prohibits uh, the, uh, the, uh, the exploration and extraction of, uh, of fracked of fracked gas onshore. And just staying with oil and gas for a moment, to uh, explain the current regime, the state authorises licensees to access petroleum oil and gas products, doesn't it? That's correct. And in turn, those licensees pay royalties to the state based on the volume extracted. Correct. The framework for royalties for petroleum also assumes Crown ownership of those resources. That's right. There is no currently no mechanism 
that would allow First Nations people to participate in that generation of wealth based on their traditional ownership of those lands. That's correct. correct. And in terms of mines, um, the majority of historic mining occurred, as you mentioned, in central Victoria, but mining has occurred across the entire state. Absolutely, and we can simply refer to the Latrobe Valley, yes. uh, a Gunnokurnai country uh, where significant uh, amounts of coal uh, has been extracted and continues to be so. Um, in terms of oil, gas and coal, um, are First Nations people broadly, uh, you've said they're not participating in the wealth, are they participating in the land management at some level? Uh, some level, uh, but I would uh, certainly describe it as very um, uh, very embryonic. Um, uh, and I, I simply reflect on uh, the fact that uh, there are uh, processes of rehabilitation of land. Uh, obviously, this is once the, the land has been scarred, as, uh, and certainly traditional owner communities have made got very you know, firm views about the damage that has been done uh, through mining activities. Uh, but uh, in recent times, uh, uh, there has been uh, a, uh, an acknowledgement of the importance of traditional owner uh, conversations and involvement uh, in at least the rehabilitation processes of, uh, of land that has been mined. Um, the Environment Minister was asked some broad questions around this, but I take it you accept that extraction activities damages land and that land is irreparably changed and altered. Definitely, yes. And that those benefiting from uh, the extraction of resources may have some obligation to remediate lands, but there has no been no effective restoration of the environment of Victoria as a whole. If we consider the, the historical exploitation of the land and the resources uh, over since uh, the 1800s, uh, certainly uh, Victoria is uh, dotted with um, unrehabilitation uh, holes in the ground, if you like. Uh, there have been attempts made to uh, secure, secure um, uh, the more dangerous, if you like, physically dangerous uh, mines over periods of time. Uh, investments made. However, uh, it, we, we are coming to terms with the magnitude of that, uh, but have made some steps uh, to uh, in, into the future to avoid uh, the massive risk and liabilities uh, falling uh, on the state for rehabilitation of, uh, of mining. And that's not just the physical risk of a big hole, uh, to the state, but also the use of toxic chemicals in processes being residual in those places. That's that's correct. Uh, so as a, a point by way of example, uh, there are re rehabilitation obligations uh, required of uh, the, th the three coal mines uh, uh, in the Latrobe Valley, and we're working through the rehabilitation uh, strategy of that. Uh, and also uh, engaging uh, with traditional owners in terms of um, what can healing potentially look like. Having said that, uh, the owners of the current owners of these mines, these three declared mines, as they're referred to in legislation, are required to up update their re rehabilitation plans and present them to the state over the course of the next year or two. Can I just ask, who holds them accountable for those rehabilitation plans? The Earth Resources Regulator uh, within DECA. And has there ever been any repercussions for not doing that at this point, do we know? Uh, we're, if, if we're talking about coal mining, uh, uh, rehabilitation is something that is relatively new because these mines have existed now for some time, although there is an ongoing uh, requirement for a, um, progressive rehabilitation, if you like, uh, progressive rehabilitation of an operating mine continues. So as, um, a part of a mine uh, is extracted uh, and then moves to extraction within the broader footprint, they move away from that. Uh, there is uh, supposed to be uh, progressive rehabilitation undertaken. Uh, bonds are paid uh, 
uh, to as a, a if you like a surety for that progressive rehabilitation uh, of of uh, mining activity on uh, with with to do, with to do with coal and other resources also. And that is that in conjunction with first with traditional owners of the lands that they're. No. Certainly, That's... certainly not. Uh, up until very recently, uh, we do expect uh, that the declared mine owners of the uh, of of uh, the coal mines uh, in uh, a, a take on uh, the engagement with traditional owners in terms of what their final rehabilitation plan. It's not mandatory. Uh, I will check on whether that is mandatory for the declared mines, but generally speaking, uh, it is not mandatory throughout the resources uh, sector in terms of rehabilitation. Minister, I'm just a bit, and perhaps you can explain it to me, it seems that First Peoples of Victoria have been totally excluded from any of the benefits of all of these mines. I'm just a bit sort of perplexed as why they're being bought in now at the problem end. Um, I, I cannot content. I cannot dispute that at all. And the question is why. Uh, and the fact is, we have failed for uh, decades uh, to acknowledge that the land that was allowed to be exploited and was exploited came uh, at to, with no benefit to traditional owners. Uh, and certainly it was despite traditional owners. I, I, I just again, I'm just a bit concerned on some of the problem, having got no benefit, some of the problem is being now transferred to traditional owners. Uh, the, the problem, yes, we, we are now presenting, if, if, if I may, if I've understood that correctly, we are now presenting what we think is an opportunity uh, to traditionalise, to be engaged in a process that is after, after the fact uh, in terms of trying to remove some of the harm that the exploitation of uh, land resources uh, have, have, have created. Um, I acknowledge that, uh, and I acknowledge that um, it is far too late. Um, but uh, what I hope to achieve myself uh, personally, and I want to uh, be able to uh, take the learnings uh, and the journey that we've had thus far with renewable energy in terms of uh, the early engagement, uh, the early opportunities, the early um, views of traditional owners and benefit sharing from the renewable energy uh, system that we've got underway. Uh, I, I'm, my intention as the Resources Minister is to take uh, that, that approach to apply also to future uh, exploration and extraction of, of, of minerals uh, so that there is an absolute, well, firstly, that there is meaningful engagement uh, with First Peoples uh, that we um, take into account uh, a prop in, in the, the determination of granting of licences and leases, um, the, the, the values of First Peoples in terms of their country, but also I, community benefits. I, I guess my, my main point is that it seems, I'm just wondering, is there actual real benefit sharing, not symbolic, not yes. that caring, if the First Peoples being involved in rehabilitation and other things rather than just being bought in as part of the, at the problem end, uh, and yes. they inherit the problem rather than any of the benefits. Yes, uh, I, I would say that uh, I, I can certainly point to a grant here and there, but that's not the answer uh, to it, and, and I acknowledge that. Um, that is not good enough, uh, and there is a lot to be done uh, and, and, and I would say that the resources sector is probably the mm. one that is the most uh, underdone in, in acknowledgement and in actually turning things around so that we actually do deliver real uh, benefits for traditional for, for traditional owners. Minister, my questions will address the revenue from gold and other uh, minerals and the illegal illegal possession of land. I'd just like to ask you to read out again um, some of those figures, more so in the monetary value. So I think uh, it was two hundred and eighty-seven billion in gold. Can we just high level read read out those figures again, please? Uh, yes. Uh, monetary value. Thank yep. you. In today's terms, uh, the gold uh, that has been extracted in Victoria, based on weight to the current spot price of gold, 
uh, is $287.4 billion. Any of the other minerals as well, please, yes. Minister? Uh, Minister, if you need to, we can go to the DEEC of Revenue paper for those numbers. Thank you. I, I think I've found it. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, between if it's between 2010 and, and 2023, uh, other than gold, which was a global one, but but if you'd like, I'm, I'm happy to talk about gold between 2010 and 2023. Uh, gold, $149.4 million in royalties. Uh, minerals, including coal, primarily $885.6 million since 2010. And uh, for sandstone and gravel, uh, $79.5 million in royalties. Thanks for that. What steps has the government taken to return any portion of that wealth to First Peoples? It's a lot of money there. It is a lot of money um, uh, and very little has, if, if any. Uh, certainly no royalties have gone directly to traditional owners, uh, royalties that are collected uh, by the department goes directly into consolidated revenue. The, the, the high probability is, if any, has gone back to TOs, traditional owners. Uh, not, not that you would say is a, is is some type of acknowledgement that uh, that uh, wealth has been extracted for the state. Minister, what would be required to have TOs ready to participate in that wealth? What would be required would be, uh, uh, firstly, an acknowledgement by the state, by government, uh, myself. Uh, to that uh, things have to be done differently. Uh, there is an opportunity uh, that uh, uh, we are developing right now, which is a strategy for critical minerals, and critical minerals is obviously a, a future-looking um, uh, oppor set of opportunities. Uh, and what I uh, intend to do is not uh, repeat the mistakes of the past, uh, However, they were deliberate uh, mistakes and errors and uh, judgments made, um, but that the critical mineral strategy where Victoria is actually having, has identified uh, a bonanza, if you like, of potential minerals uh, of significant value globally uh, that can contribute to renewable energy development and other types of uh, production. Uh, my intention is to uh, embed within a critical mineral strategy, the development of that, of course, in consultation with traditional owner communities, uh, uh, concept of community benefit sharing, traditional owner benefit sharing, but also, of course, a proper, uh, properly formally recognised um, uh, set of rules around uh, what does meaningful engagement mean, what does um, permissioning mean, what does... Uh, uh, what what can what can be derived from uh, a forward looking strategy f for self determination purposes, and, and that is about shifting power and resources, of course, ultimately to traditional. Yeah. Uh, and you've touched upon this. Did you want to elaborate any further on how the how can the government secure the economic prosperity of traditional owners or first peoples here in Victoria using this wealth? Well, um, we have to acknowledge uh, that. Uh, and more than acknowledge, but acknowledge in the first instance that uh, traditional and first peoples uh, cannot possibly um, be able to secure what self determination means for them and dis and choices without having a embedded and um, uh, how can I put it reliable in economics a, a source of income revenue for themselves over a period of a long period of time for them to be able to. Um, deal with capacity and capability uh, and to be able to plan for how they can best utilise uh, any wealth that does come to them, either through uh, processes that I hope to deploy through uh, renewable energy processes, uh, what the future might be in mineral extractions and also ultimately through treaties. So we need to um, facilitate and enable First Peoples to have that ongoing secure revenue stream over a long period of time so that the governance piece for traditionalised, which I, I often hear from them, uh, is, 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 is one that they must be able to create for themselves, for them to then be able to use that as a, a springboard to really develop up their own economic prosperity in the future. I just want to make a 
one last comment as well. Um, you mentioned the word capability. Um, we've got a lot of talented people, a lot of capability. I think the main thing that we really need to focus in on is capacity. We don't have the resources to strengthen the capacity, but we certainly, as a people, have the capability um, to be able to contribute in all facets of our cultural rights and our expression and so forth. Thanks. Thank you. And Minister, you would recognise, following on from that question, uh, there's not just a need to secure the income on an enduring basis uh, so that it can't be a lump of money that just disappears and TOs have to rock up year on year with their hands out, but it has to be uh, an investment in capacity as well. Well, yes, and that, and that's that's what you need to be able to yeah. actually shift power meaningfully uh, by, by, by ensuring that there is that enduring uh, revenue and, and resourcing. Absolutely. You, you know, we're, we're, we're kidding ourselves as a government if we think that Self-determination can be achieved uh, through through uh, more tentative arrangements when it comes to wealth uh, uh, wealth sharing, uh, and uh, and that's something that uh, I know that um, through and and I think if I may, I mean I, I know that um, uh, and I, I t tend to use the word journey a lot, but I know that we've got to do more than go on a journey because we've got to now start delivering outcomes and, and results that people can judge us by, absolutely. Um, what, what I can say, though, is that uh, my commitment and, and the commitment of, of DECA um, know that uh, we, we've got to get on with it. I mean, I know that there, we have a lot of, you know, frameworks and policies in place and they all come from a very important place because it's not just what we do, why we do it, and how, but we just got to get on and actually create that meaningful um, revenue stream, revenue base that, that is enduring to enable First Peoples to really truly uh, take control of their future and, and be able to make the choices for themselves. With, with those large amounts of figures that you've expressed to us here today, uh, as an individual, how do, like how does that sit with you being sitting here and saying this is this is two weeks in a row? That we've heard ministers come before us and we're talking we're not just talking dollars and cents here we're talking billions of dollars that our people have been shut out of being able to generate prosperity and and, and economic independence and wealth like how does that sit with you um it, it, it's it's terribly uncomfortably but you know that's an understatement and i don't know that i could say it in any way that would um could really describe i mean it's horrifying Maybe that's probably the best word. It, it is horrifying and unforgivable that we've allowed this situation uh, for many of us to benefit from it uh, at the expense of First Peoples. And and it continues because we've not fixed it. Yeah. I, I find it striking that it's taken this Truth Commission to get to a conversation like this about what is possible from the wealth of this country and we all we all know you know it's 150 years of welfare and so-called protection child protection and all, all of the uh, pipeline effects of that into the welfare system and that is institutionalized social workers mainly the people that talked about our policies. We need a different kind of approach, different mindset, and we don't need pretty reconciliation action plans. We actually need strategies divide, divide, um, <clears throat> devised with our people, with traditional owners, with people in place. Uh, I mean, it's a, for me, it's a, a stark moment, a contrast, because any other conversations about welfare have sat inside the state at some committee level that sort of didn't go anywhere in big uh, in in any big commitments and this is just a stark reality about how far we have been ignored in our spaces for this time i'm sorry it's a statement but i have to make it it's just so stark Seems to be. I mean, we, we've heard evidence around squatters and illegal activity, illegal, you know, stealing of land, and a lot of 
unregulated industries, sectors, but our people are regulated and have been regulated since arrival. We're even hearing regulation after the effect to accommodate mining and all of that, you know, mm. it's... it's our people anyway, are still being regulated. That's the point that I'm yes. making here. We overregulated. How can we be self-determining if we're overregulated and can't be able to, you know, find breaks to be able to generate wealth or even just be able to keep our families together? Thank you for those figures. I mean, that's. Can I just add? To, sorry, Tony. Um, that we have heard over the last two weeks lots of future aspirations about what could be different, but very little of what has actually happened to date. And I I just wonder how can first peoples listening in here not feel that this is more virtue signaling rather than actually a real, and I'm loath to use the word commitment because we um, we can't bank commitments, we have commitments constantly that never get fulfilled. Why would first peoples have any faith that things are going to be different? If, if I may, uh, uh, yes, and 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 I I I I am saying, and I and I will say a whole bunch of things today, uh, and ultimately um, that's well and good, uh, but the proof has to be in the evidence uh, and the transparency and and outcomes. What I will say though is that um, my commitment and my government's commitment, and I, I can say this: there are some cabinet matters that are matters before cabinet but but i can say to you very clearly today that uh in terms of uh potential for wealth sharing and and enduring wealth sharing uh we are very much looking at embedding uh in in a legal sense um benefit sharing arrangements from uh infrastructure projects around uh, transmission infrastructure but also the renewable energy zones uh, and and projects that are built, uh, and and, and uh, I'm committed to achieving that, and and I'm I'm hoping that it won't be too long um, before that is that becomes very evident uh, to the commission and to all first peoples. Uh, and and my commitment is to seek to apply the same approach uh, to future extraction of resources. Um, the approach being that uh, it's not just about the revenue sharing, but it's also about um, you know conf informed consent uh, and uh, and 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 the principles that are certainly uh, embedded in uh, United Nations um, uh, uh, declaration sure. for Indigenous peoples. So um, that that is something that is is guiding my approach, uh, the department's approach, and government. And uh, and, I, and as I said uh, earlier, I know resources has been we've been a laggard there, um, uh, even though we're not anywhere near perfect <laughs> in terms of renewable energy. But uh, my uh, my commitment is to bring that up to speed, and so that you can actually start to see and know that uh, this will happen. Uh, I'm sorry, that was not a very eloquent way for me to answer, but I apologise. Uh, Minister, the renewable energy strategy framework principle or whatever it is, is a program which uh, I think has a time frame of ultimately producing something a long way into the future. Is it uh, um, 10 years or so before... It, it, is that roughly the time frame? I think I remember 2038. Yeah. Well, if I may, thank you, Commissioner. If I may, uh, uh, we've made a... I can just a, 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 a focused answer on the timing because I've got other questions that lead oh, from course. that. So depends on the re long... renewable, Commissioner. Depends on the renewable because we're talking about a number of solar, wind. Say wind. Yeah, well, well there, there are, I think so, wind is what I was looking at. Well, there are ongoing, uh, there is an ongoing pipeline, if you like, so on, uh, with, to do with wind. There's onshore wind, which is being developed and, and built. Uh, every Almost every day there's some uh, 
project that has either uh, been approved uh, through planning or under construction, but certainly what needs to be built between now and 2035 in Victoria. Okay, that's the date I think that's I was... The date, yes. Okay, 2035, let's focus on that. Yes. So the community benefit uh, payment that you were talking about relates to that program that will be um, online, if you like, uh, in over 10 years from now. Well, the, yes, but the commencement of that will be uh, subject to um, some further discussions that we're in with um, uh, First Peoples. But there, won't, there won't be any money flowing through the community benefit for more than 10 years. No, no, that's not correct. True? Uh, no. Uh, what, and, and I, and I apologise, I can only say so much because some of it is, is, is cabinet in confidence and it hasn't very much gone through that process yet. But uh, the intention is this, is that um, if I may, uh, I didn't, this, this is what I've been able to say publicly thus far, is that with new transmission projects that will start to be built uh, in the next two or three years, that they have to be established and built. Certainly there's the Victorian um, the VNI West, which is a massive transmission project uh, up north and west of Victoria. There's also the Western Renewables Link. There's also transmission that is coming in to connect up offshore wind energy. There's also um, a community benefit that we are looking to embed through uh, renewable energy project development themselves. They are the ones that will be built sooner than transmission because, yes, transmission does take a long time to be built and it's only once they, they are built that benefits start to be derived. However, each renewable energy project, once it is captured by this legal architecture that we're working on, uh, will uh, have embedded in it uh, a community benefit arrangement for traditional. But we are talking about years rather than months in for the first flow of money. Uh, yes, because it, it's subject to uh, declaring the renewable energy zone. So it's subject yeah. to legislation, definitely, yes. But it is it's years. Months. It's not months. Not months. But it right. won't be 10 years and it'll be less than that, a lot less than that. Well, um the the principle that's embedded in that concept is that there should be um, a share of a revenue stream that goes to first peoples is that so yes um we've been talking about uh, extraction industries that go back beginning of victoria why is it that or is it the position that any that this principle should be applied to those old style extractive industries, gold, coal, gas? I mean, you, you're talking, you get the point. We're talking about future projects that are years away, or um, but we have in front of us right now the figures you've given us of actual money being flowing through the system right now, if the principle is right for renewables, why isn't it right for gold extracted today? Uh, it, it is right for both. Uh, and, and I acknowledge that uh, the resources sector, uh, we have not as a government uh, had uh, the clearer eye as we have had towards renewables and, and that's got to change. But it's... Uh, Seems to me, isn't it much easier to apply the principle to what's happening now than to something where you've got to negotiate the whole, you know, the, the engineering, for instance, of of wind farms? I mean, that seems to be, it's a very major project, as you've said, transmission systems. But we've got, like, as we sit here now, um, I think Commissioner Hunter the other day pointed out in relation to child protection, whilst we're sitting here, another child is taken away. Whilst we're sitting here today, there's coal being extracted, gold being extracted. And I, I don't quite follow why the same thinking doesn't apply in those extractive industries right now. Right now. Uh, uh, that, that is our failing, and uh, I'm, I'm not even making an excuse for it. Um, but but I will say that my aim is uh, to work towards turning that around and, and having those conversations within government 
uh, around how we can do that and, and doing that um, as soon as we possibly can. But there's nothing underway, is there? Uh, no, uh, only to the extent that I've been able to share thus far that we will be developing a critical mineral strategy. Uh, no, I'm talking about the, the the existing extractive industry. That's correct. Not 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 any that is sanctioned by the government. No, if, if there are arrangements in place between individual uh, extractors and and traditional owners, but they are certainly not required. But there's no current government attention to this obvious source of community benefit? Not not other than what I've already indicated. Well, you said that none is yes. failing, and so there's not even a discussion about it, despite <clears throat> the fact that it seems to be the obvious way of doing something immediately. Well, to, to be fair to the Minister, Commissioner, there was a mention of Cabinet and Confidence discussions that we I won't ask the minister directly about beyond the indication you've given. But, um, uh, well, I didn't understand that to be in relation to this subject matter. Mm. But any, in any event, we can leave it there. Um, uh, I would be assisted to know um, about annual figures. What you've given is royalty figures for these, I can call them traditional extractive operations, um, figures that date for the last 14 years from 2010, but um, it would be, I think, useful to know in relation to each of the commodities that are that you've mentioned what the annual royalties are, um, because at least in my own thinking, that's the figure that I would be asking. Well, um, even a very tiny proportion of that, um, if mm -hmm would a flow as a, a direct um, revenue flow mm. would seem to be in accord with the principle applied to the forthcoming... Um, can can I suggest, um, Commissioner, we have um, behind tab 11 a paper that's called the resources paper. I was going to come to that and the details of the revenue set out in that, but I was going to suggest, Chair, that we have a short break before picking up that revenue stream and uh, the um, it, it's a next year um, B to that um, document, but but I was going to suggest a short break. Um, before I do that, I, there was one thing I wanted to loop back to before I lose it. So, Commissioner, with your permission, if we can come back to that revenue figures after the break. Um, yes. Well, I, I and mean, renewables I mean, generally. Suits. Yep. Um, so there is one question I wanted to pick up from the earlier discussion, Minister, and and that is around, on me, remediation of mines. Before we move on from that topic, you said in terms of remediation of mines, um, that depends, of course, on. We're talking about orphan mines and, and and remediation obligations generally. First of all, the successful remediation of mines depends first on the adequacy of the environmental bond that is lodged, um, whether that's a paper or a sort of online entry only or a cash deposit, depends on the adequacy of that bond in the first instance and depends obviously on the solvency of the operator. That's correct. Now, if the bond is inadequate, or the operator is insolvent uh, or wound up for whatever reason, the burden falls upon government That's to true. attend to the environmental remediation of those mines, correct? That's correct. And uh, not only on government but and on landholders and on First Nations people who depend on their connection to country, correct? That's correct. Yep. And would you accept that traditional owners are perhaps least... Oh, so, sorry, are uh, disproportionately impacted by those mines and are also least able to address those remnant environmental impacts. Yes, definitely. Uh, and, and if I may, uh, and, and bonds have not taken into account, well, what is it that we're seeking to rehabilitate when it comes to damage of uh, the values of the of land and and cultural heritage. Yes, uh, all of those matters are certainly not captured by bonds. 
And there is a capacity to require an environmental bond to factor in those requirements, isn't there? Uh, With changes to legislation, uh, regulations? Certainly there is always an ability to be able to do that. Is that something you would be open to to considering? Uh, I I certainly, uh, not being able to speak on behalf of my my cabinet, or uh, but certainly, uh, I, I would be very, uh, I would be very, um, how can I put it, uh, prepared to look into that to see uh, if there is something that can be done to better reflect uh, the real harm that is being done through um, extractive industries. So I'm, I'm very happy to be able to. Can I just make a comment on that? How do you put a number or a figure on a bond for spiritual connection to land that's broken? for sacred sites that are desecrated, for our cultural connection, not only ours but generations to come that's been severed due to the broken or breaking of country. Like how do you rehabilitate those things and how do you put a bond to them? Thank you. And and that that's um uh certainly uh with with uh uh, mining that is already underway. I mean, certainly, you know, how do you capture something that has been lost? I, I, I appreciate that. I, I think with any new approvals for any new mining activities, the the, the point really is to try is is to the best we can to avoid harm in the we, first place. We we lose our our totems within these processes at points, which is our connection, and that will affect generations. I'm I'm also thinking about. The generations that were lost of their stuff that I'm learning now that I should have been handed down due to desecration of sites, of of language, due to dispossession of our land, they're things we are never going to get back that you cannot ever put a monetary value on. It's just sad. I, I think it was more of a comment than a, because it, it's something that, you know, we can sit here and talk about monetary values and we can talk, but I think about my ancestors and what they passed down that was completely lost or, or even our ancestors are lost due to desecration of their burial sites. And I just, we talk about bond and, and you know, rehabilitation, but this stuff we're never, ever going to get back. Um, So, Chair, is that a convenient time for a break? I will come back to Commissioner North's uh, questions around revenues and also the renewables sector generally. 
Council. Shall we? Shall we resume? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, one of the things I asked you before the break was in relation to revenue from private land, from extractables. Uh, did you have an answer to that over the break? Yes, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to have um, sought that uh, answer. Uh, now, uh, revenue from private... So if we look at quarries, um, given that uh, private land is deemed to be uh, anything... Uh, down to 15 metres below the surface. There's no royalty that is uh, applied or, or applicable or collected for up to 15 metres below. But once uh, it's beyond 15 metres, which then ceases to be private land and becomes so-called crown land, that's when royalty is payable. Um, the, so, so I think I, on that one, I, I know that there may have been some no, I think there was also part of that question was around revenue generated for permissions or there's some revenues that is generated from permissions and but effectively it is very much, well, it's actually less than a cost recovery basis. Um, uh, so there's no real net, if you like, net <coughs> revenue uh, that the state collects from the actual issuing of grants and licences and, and permits. When you, just to understand that, when you say it's a cost recovery basis, does that mean the people, the person or, or body with the permit asserts what their costs are and then there's an adjustment for that? Uh, no, uh, the the state, uh, the Earth Resources Regulator, the state uh, determines what uh, the uh, costs will be for uh, uh, a permit application or a licence application, etc. Uh, that gets charged to a proponent. Uh, and that is the money that is received for it. It doesn't. It doesn't cover a hundred percent of the cost of actually administering, if you like, that regime. Okay, thank you, uh, commissioners. I wanted to turn now to the department response in terms of the revenues. Uh, the department provided some information in response to a request for information. This is, should be, I hope, behind tab eleven in your folder. The revenue paper. Sorry, tab 10, I think it is, not 11. <clears throat> Sorry, tab 11. That's for the Commissioner's purpose. It's the revenue paper for you, Minister. Yes. Um, this document has a number of annexures as well including, and we'll come back to this, Annexure B concerning self-determination frameworks and Annexure D, which sets out uh, the annual revenue obtained by the state over each financial year for each commodity, correct? Yes. Okay. So starting with the paper itself, um, pardon me, I'm just making a note to come back to some other matters. Uh, starting with this paper itself, if we turn to page 3, point, uh, 2.3, hypothecated revenue. Two point three. if we could bring that up on the screen. This is page 3 of 18. Oh, yes. Uh, if we could zoom in, please, under the heading 2.3, hypothecated revenue, there are two paragraphs there. First of all, what is hypothecated revenue? Uh, well, uh, hypothecated revenue is uh, re revenue that is collected uh, by the state, uh, which is collected and then tied to a specific purpose in terms of its use. That is my uh, understanding of hypothecated revenue as distinct from revenues that are collected from a, a specific purpose that goes into a consolidated fund. Um, so we talked this morning about uh, funds that go into the consolidated fund. This is talking about those hypothecated revenues which are prescribed to be used only for certain purposes. Yes. And uh, the department manages a number of trust accounts, which are set out in um, under that heading 2.3, various trusts. Uh, and 
um, trusts that were managed before various changes to machinery government. And you note there collectively the balance of those funds. Could you tell us what that number is, please? Uh, yes, for the financial year 2021 to 22, uh, these, the, the value of the monies held in these trust funds by DECA was uh, in the order of, uh, I think I'm reading it correctly. 1.28 billion? 1 million, no, no, 1 billion, 281 million, 536 thousand dollars. Yep. And that represents a single year? One financial year, that's right. Okay. Now, if we turn to uh, page 10 of this document. Um, under section four there is set out a table of key revenue streams for Victorian the Victorian government from natural resources related revenue. Correct? Yes. So on page 10, for example, royalties, extractive industries, quarries on Crown land, and then in the right-hand column, we see do traditional owners primarily benefit from revenue? There's a dash. Come back one column to the left, overall revenue and fund use. So, for example, for this, extractive industries, quarries, 7.8 million into consolidated revenue. Uh, for that particular line item, correct? Correct. And just so I understand it, the dash, do traditional owners primarily benefit from revenue, indicates no. That's correct, zero. So for each type of resources revenue collected by the Victorian government set out under Section 4 on pages 10, 11 and 12, for each of those sums, the answer is zero or no to the the question, do traditional owners primarily benefit from re revenue? That's correct. And just to pick some examples, for example, royalties, the second line item, royalties from gold on private and cr crown land where annual production is in excess of 2,500 ounces, the figure is $42.8 million into consolidated revenue collected to provide for state-funded programs and services, do traditional owners primarily benefit from this revenue? No. That's correct. So in my arithmetic, that adds up to around about just over $200 million a year, roughly speaking. All of those columns, Commissioner? Sorry? All, all of those entries? Yes. Yes. So if one was looking to a principle of community benefit, then um, that might be a figure that uh, would give you an annual uh, basis upon which to even apply a small percentage to Indigenous communities in aid of self-determination, which seems to be what lies behind the renewable projects far into the future. Yes, I can all take. Um, so that this column relates to 2021-2022, this analysis. Um, is it also the case that currently traditional owners do not primarily benefit from any resources uh, revenue collected by the Victorian government? Yes, it continues to today. And that you are currently discussing that situation with your colleagues. Is that, is that uh, you can tell us? I think that's the extent that I can say that. Uh, if we stay with this document and turn to Annex D, within the same tab, um, do you have a document that has this orange heading along the top like that? Yes. But so Annex D. This an extra D, yeah. Next D, yes. But, 
Ah. Um, do you see the page of that annexure which is headed uh, It's the entry in my bundle. It's the second page. I'm not sure if it's your first page, Minister. The box is headed Deca Resources Victoria. Then we're looking at royalty extractive industries quarries on Crown land. Yes. Final column there, the nominal sum is expressed to be 79.5 million. I understand you want to correct that number. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry that that's uh, an error. The the actual figure is eighty seven point four million dollars. What's it's, the nominal sum? The, if I may, the, the nominal sum is uh, each financial year from 2010 to financial year 2023. That's the aggregate for of uh, uh, income revenues. Uh, from quarrying. Um, so just total of all those years. Great. Just just to reiterate that, so commissioners are following. Each column under the orange heading, twenty ten, and then for each year broken down, twenty ten to twenty twenty three, sets out a number representing the royalty paid for. Um, the various line entries, extractive industries, gold, coal, and so on. And then as we go across the page, we get to the nominal sum, which is the total of those over that period of time, correct? Correct, yes. Um, and oil and gas, let me just find that. The total for that period of time, which is 2010 to 2023, is 41.6 million. That's correct. The last financial year, 2023, the sum was 7 million. That's correct. Okay. Now, when we come to the entry for renewables, Um, we this table tells us DECA does not collect revenue from renewable energy. Uh, th that's correct. So just pausing there, there is no royalty paid for renewable energy, whether that be solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, any sort of renewable. Exactly. So... Effectively, for the electricity sector, there, there are no royalties. Okay. Now, I want to come back to the investment in renewables and come back to our discussion about that. And uh, the document, um, the rights and legislative framework document, sorry, to ask you about power generation and the state's transition away from coal. <coughs> so we can leave that an extra for now unless commissioners have specific questions about those, those no, entries. No, thank you. Um, so in terms of power generation in Victoria, mm -hmm. Victoria is committed to the transition away mm -hmm. from brown coal as a source of energy production, correct? That's correct. And our current electricity system, if I can frame it uh, and summarise, correct me if I'm wrong, our current electricity system relies on power generators to supply consumers with electricity. Historically, that has included the major operations in the Latrobe Valley, but in future, we will be looking at renewables across the state. That's correct. Primarily coal, a little bit of uh, uh, gas. 
Our electricity system relies on those power generators to supply consumers with around 55 terawatt hours of electricity per year. Correct. In 2023, Victoria's brown coal power stations generated around 60% of that. Yes, about 59%. And that was compared to 84% in 2014. That's correct. So that number is coming down and it's largely due to the closure of Hazelwood Power Station in 2017. And and also the expansion of renewable energy production because that then affects, it has a displacing effect, if you like, on fossil fuel generation. So those two things together, but primarily the closure of Hazelwood, correct? Now that uh, expansion of the renewable energy capacity has been um, accelerated so that uh, the transition to close your lawn power station was four years ahead of schedule, approximately. Uh, Hazelwood, n- not really. I mean, th- the the owners of Hazelwood uh, Power Station, Onji Energy, uh, made the decision to close within a matter of months of, of announcement. So it was very unexpected in that regard, although it had been intimated for a number of years so that it could close. And for your lawn? Uh, your lawn uh, was, uh, uh, y- your lawn as, uh, the owners of your lawn is Energy Australia and and the date of the closure of 2028 uh, was uh, a, a date that uh, was nominated by Energy Australia but was also contained within a structured agreement uh, with uh, DECA, with government, uh, to ensure that there was a a smooth uh, closure, if you like, uh, of of that power station. In terms of other closures, uh, in September 2022, AGL announced it will close Luoyang A power station in 2035. That was about 10 years earlier than previously indicated. Yes, that, that that's correct. And again, there was a, 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 a also a structured agreement uh, with uh, between. Uh, uh, AGL and uh, the Victorian government. Alinta Energy's closure for Luoyang B power station is 2047. That's their licence end date, if yes. you like, but uh, uh, yes, but that, that's correct. And they're currently exploring options to retrofit that plant to run on biomass. That's what they indicate. Since 2014, the government's renewable energy policies and programmes have seen um, a a rapid expansion of renewable energy development in Victoria. And just tell me if I'm correct, 25 large-scale wind and 35, sorry, 34 large-scale solar projects commissioned. That's uh, correct. And a further 17 large-scale wind and solar projects under commission or under construction. That's correct. So the closure of these power stations creates considerable challenges for government, correct? That's true. Nevertheless, you would accept that there needs to be in the renewable sector continuing uh, commitment to the opportunity for First Nations people to participate in the management of and benefit of wealth from these activities. Yes. Um, By between 2014 and the end of 2023, Victoria's commissioned large-scale wind capacity increased almost fourfold Rooftop solar capacity increased from less than one gigawatt to around 4.4 gigawatts and around 1.4 gigawatts of large-scale solar capacity was commissioned, correct? That's correct. Sorry, 1.1 gigawatts. And then just to finish these numbers, as of March 2024, Victoria has 1.7 gigawatts of large-scale wind and solar projects under construction or commissioning and a further 6.8 gigawatts of large-scale wind and solar projects with planning approval but not yet commencing construction. Yes. What does that mean in terms of... um, Those projects government-owned or private? Uh, The the, the wind ones. Sorry. Uh, Those are uh, are all privately uh, owned. Uh, There will be some that have... uh, that, that are still privately owned, but are, are facilitated by um, a, a number of auctions that and contracts that have come out of auctions that the Victorian government has uh, run to help incentivise the build. But primarily, they are private sector investment. The only, if I may, Commissioner, just on that, um, the one exception is uh, uh, in 
just recently, towards the end of last year, the State Electricity Commission the, uh, has uh, announced um, a partnership uh, with a private sector investor to build a, a large battery uh, system in Victoria, and there will be more. There will be a greater share of state-owned um, mm. investment and portion of renewable energy that will be built between now and 2035. Um, so that, that investment in renewables, um, particularly in Victoria, wind and solar, has seen the share of renewable energy in Victoria's electricity generation profile increase from around 10, 10.8%, 2014 to more than 38% in 2021, correct? Correct. And uh, are you able to update that number today or what the projected numbers are? Uh, yes, I am. In fact, uh, uh, during the course of last year, the, the, once we've understood the whole of the year in terms of electricity generation, uh, electricity generated from renewable sources amounted to just over 39% in Victoria. Now, um, we've just noted in the Annexure D document that no annual renewal, uh, annual revenues collected by the Victorian government uh, as of yet. That's correct. So how does the state benefit from, uh, and it may not, from the use of lands, wind, sun and other forms of renewable energy generation? Uh, the, as a government, we have not made a determination for any royalties to be to apply to uh, to um, new renewable energy projects, whether they are generation or storage technologies. Uh, we are, though, as, as I talked about, uh, uh, have made uh, decisions around the concepts of community benefit sharing to be associated with those projects. Um, so you mentioned generation and storage. Yes. In what way, let's start with generation, is it contemplated that community will benefit from the generation of renewable energy? Yes. So, so what, uh, what, what uh, I have uh, indicated publicly, what the government has indicated publicly is that through the build of new transmission infrastructure uh, and new uh, renewable energy projects, uh, whether they be generation projects or storage projects, uh, that there would be uh, an, an element of community benefit sharing as a result of those projects. And, and when you talk about community, you're talking about Victorian community? Uh, two, in, in fact, two discrete uh, benefit sharing arrangements, if I can put it that way. One is for the, a broader regional local community uh, and a separate one uh, for traditional owners. Um, could you just explain that separate one for traditional owners and what, what will happen there? I, I'm not able to give you um, uh, explicit details because the matters that are before Cabinet. Yes. Uh, uh, but uh, I I believe that uh, once that we are able to publicly uh, talk about those, uh, once we've gone through, of course, proper engagement with traditional owners themselves because of how this will operate and, and ensuring that there's um, we have taken into account um, uh, the views of traditional owner communities that uh, I, I have confidence that we will be able to uh, show uh, that the, the, the system that we will have in place will go to that very question of uh, a longer term enduring revenue stream for First Peoples. Um, Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Uh, it's about uh, having that uh, that transference of, of power and, and resources uh, that is ultimately vital to be able to achieve a self determination. Minister, can I just ask you this? It's a bit of a micro question, and maybe you don't know it, but um, the the coal that's mined, is that, um, that's been used to generate power, but is it also 
exported or used elsewhere? Uh, Commissioner, uh, with the, the particular na physical nature of the brown coal resource in, in Victoria, in the Latrobe Valley, principally, because of its physical uh, makeup, can't be exported. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hence, we've never had a coal export industry, unlike some other states where they've had black coal, which mm -hmm. is not combustible. So, I think that's really the point. Brown coal is highly combustible. So, it's only really ever been used for electricity generation, domestic electricity generation. But I noticed that the, the royalty revenue um, from coal has not decreased the last five or six years, whereas the um, amount of renewables to generate electricity has. So how how is that explained? Uh, well, there, there was a period uh, a, a handful of years ago where the actual value of the royalty increased. Just coming back to self-determination and the questions around that, Minister, in your witness statement, you um, state in paragraph 17 that for you, self-determination and country are interwoven. And in paragraph 18, you state you support First Peoples' right to self-determination as reflected, reflected in UNDRIP as key to First Peoples' opportunity to empower and enable themselves to achieve what they aspire to for their country. So I take it you would accept, Minister, that the Victorian Government should be funding programs to enable self-determination by First Peoples and traditional owners in the energy and resources sector? Yes, I do. Paragraph 19, you state that in your portfolios this means broadening and strengthening the meaningful partnerships with traditional owners across the state. So do you accept that self-determination is more than just meaningful partnerships? It can be meaning handing over control completely? Absolutely. I, I, and I, and I realise that certainly we've gone from, um, you know, an inclusionary conversation to partnership, but, but it's really self-determination is about that transfer of power and resources ultimately. Um, I want to ask you some question about the status and funding for self-determination programs in your portfolio, just to touch on these, um, referring to the DECA re response. Is it an extra B? Thanks. This is back to tab 10, commissioners. So um, the department was asked – sorry, I'll wait till you've got that, Minister. I've got that. Thank you. Uh, the department was asked to identify all current and recent uh, policies, roadmaps, strategies and so on concerning supporting First Peoples' rights and interests in a connection to country insofar as land, water, natural resources uh, and other aspects are concerned. And w we know that you are able to speak to some of those – and then for each self-determination and other policy and framework that out various policy commitments, what their implementation status is, barriers and so on. Okay. Yes. So some of these you can speak to. If we come to uh, paragraph 10 years uh, on the Wild Goose Chess Minister, I'm sorry. So before we get to that in extra B and to frame this, the response, yeah. sorry, the RFI response, which is tab 10 for commissioners, Tab 10 for commissioners at paragraph 10.
Do, do commissioners have the document? This is under the heading natural resources, is it, uh, Ms. Rick? And it's on the screen, Minister. Uh, okay, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I'm a bit behind everyone. Yeah. Is that number 10? I'm just. Yes, uh, paragraph number 10 of the RFI of response that. document. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. No, that's all right, I was in the wrong place too. Um, and you've already noted this in paragraph 10, there's no specific funding to support First Peoples self-determination in relation to earth resources activities in addition to the Native Title Act and TOS Act assessment resourcing. But you note earth resources projects do engagement, do include engagement and consultation as part of project planning, correct? That's right. So the limit of it at the moment is conversations. Yes. Um, then we look at paragraph 13 of that same on that same page in terms of energy. There's a reference to grant funding programs to support traditional owner engagement in the energy transition. $1.1 million for traditional owner renewable energy program announced in November 2020, right? Yes. Now, is that a one-off $1.1 million? Yes. And registered Aboriginal parties, so those organisations who had secured RAPs, were eligible to apply for grants of up to 100000 That's correct. And this traditional owner renewable energy program, of which it looks like nine RAPs have received funding totalling 900000 for a range of renewables, mm -hmm. is the extent of grant funding supporting traditional owner engagement in energy transition. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking that there may be some additional funding, again, one-off, um, uh, for the purposes of offshore wind energy engagement. But uh, but in terms of these grant programs, I, I think that that is the extent of it. But, but I'm, I, I can come back to you to make sure I haven't got that last comment incorrect. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to you on that one. And the funding for those projects is due to be delivered by June 2024, correct? That's correct. June 2024? 20. Projects to be delivered by that time. Yeah. I'm sorry, the funding has already been allocated of 900000 for projects to be delivered by June 2024. Is that how I understand that? I think funding, some, some of this is about funding being uh, given, um, uh, transferred over in, in some instances. Okay, so just so, to be clear about that, each project was uh, able to obtain up to 100,000? That's correct. And the total of 1.1 million of grant funding um, has not been allocated? 900,000 has been allocated? Uh, yes. Does that mean nine projects? Uh, if, if you allow me an opportunity to see if I can find that answer for you. I was just looking at 13A. Uh, sorry, you've referred to 13A, is that, that yes, correct? Yes, it's up on the screen if that's oh, any yes, help. Yes, I apologise. Um, no, yes, so so uh, uh, nine uh, RAPs have received funding totalling that amount. Uh, yes. And the, the question is uh, the, the, the difference between that and $1.1 $1 .1 million, is that correct? Yes, so we've got something like 300,000 still, oh, sorry, 200,000, if my math is right, sitting unallocated. Uh, oh, yes, look, uh, what I will need to do is uh, come back to you to, uh, so that I can answer that properly yes. as to whether that 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 left that difference, if you like, uh, is uh, left in reserve for other traditional owners to be able to access or whether it's explained in some other way. Okay. Well, so I just want to be sure on that if you allow me. No that. problem. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know as well what's going to happen to the money that's unallocated. 
or not used is still in part of the delivery of that process? Will it just go back into consolidated revenue or go somewhere else? Um, are you able to tell commissioners what practical benefits have been delivered using under the TORP program to traditional owners in a broad sense? It, it will, in a broad sense, uh, the, uh, the the program uh, has, uh, has was was evolved um, after engagement with traditional owner communities about what they identified as their needs to equip them to be able to uh, plan for their own uh, e economic benefits that they could be that could be derived from renewable energy bill that that needs to happen in Victoria. And uh, each traditional owner group would uh, have a, their own approach uh, to this. Uh, it would enable them to uh, engage on country uh, with amongst themselves and to develop up plans for themselves. I know that um, that uh, sorry that there is some further info that is more specific. If that's what you're seeking, if you allow me a chance to identify that, we're talking about that hundred thousand. Sorry, Minister. Oh, so yeah, sorry. are we talking about that hundred thousand? So, out of that hundred thousand, is that what we're talking about? A hundred thousand for the traditional owner renewable energy program. These are the grants that were made to now nine wraps. Minister, is that, is that enough? Is that enough? Given no, all the the it's dollars. Near enough. Do you think First Nations people are more adversely affected with climate change given our relationship to the land? Absolutely. Uh, climate change and, and our, as colonisers, our contribution to that uh, has has devastated many traditional owner communities and the, and the land that they own. And if climate change continues the way it's going, it'll be a second dispossession for First Peoples. So that 100,000... Whether it's a hundred thousand or a million, it's so still nowhere near enough. And but it's only a hundred thousand individually. I understand. Yes, yes, I, I totally agree. Uh, and I know that this is, whilst this is a start, it's it's a small start. Uh, and my my aim and my government's aim is is to not repeat the mistakes of the past and to actually establish a system uh, that very soon I'll be able to talk more about. That will actually provide uh, a far more meaningful um, um, acknowledgement of, of, of the wealth that must be given to traditional owners from from the land. That We've just heard from all the systems in government how long everything takes, and we're, I mean, Mr. North pointed out we're still waiting, and I feel I feel like um, hearing all the evidence that. There's these little bits of monetary to just keep you going in the space, but I feel like nothing's changed within the colonial structures and systems, and it's still just little piecemeal bits and pieces, um, as, as the chair spoke about earlier, and it keeps us in a deficit, mm -hmm. and it keeps us dispossessed of our lands, spiritually, emotionally, practising culture, and I personally are offended by 100,000. Mm, can we bring up 14, paragraph 14 A and B, please? Uh, Minister, this is uh, a reference to the First People's Adoption of Renewable Energy Program funding. Uh, so could we zoom in on 14 A and B? Uh, could you just explain to the commissioners, please, what this is, the First People's Adoption of Renewable Energy Program and the funding available and expended under this program? Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, the, the design of the program is focused on um, enabling uh, First Peoples to build uh, capability to participate uh, and, and benefit in the energy transition. Uh, it, it's as, as straightforward as that because each traditional owner community will, will see the, the, the opportunities in a different way uh, and will wish to be able to uh, make decisions around uh, what and how they will be able to uh, uh, get that benefit, if you like, for themselves. 
So um, 960,000 was allocated to that FPAIR program, correct? That's uh, correct, yes. So far, five traditional owner corporations have received just uh, over half or under half of that, 450,000 of that funding. Yes. That program is due to be completed in June of next year, correct? Uh, yes, at this stage, yes. Does that mean there's half a million dollars sitting in that fund unallocated with only a year to go, uh, approximately? Yes, uh, that's correct. Uh, what I will say, though, is that the department continues to engage with uh, traditional owners who uh, have not thus far sought uh, to uh, an allocation, if you like, from that fund, uh, and uh, and that is what we hope to achieve is that that money goes out the door. Uh, now, in terms of that, that deadline that has been referred to, um, uh, if there is a need to uh, push that date out to enable traditional owners to make take full advantage of uh, uh, any funds that they uh, apply for, then uh, that that will be done by me. Okay. So, what, what, can I ask what what has been done in the department to streamline the avenues for traditional owners to be able to get access to funds? Because this is another example. So we've got the hundred thousand that that the TOs um, have to apply for grants. Given the state's commitment, the government's commitment to self-determination or, or even the Victorian Aboriginal Affairs Framework, the VAF, shouldn't there be a, 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 an expedite or a sped-up process in order for the traditional owners to be able to uh, move quickly through these processes to be able to get access to the funds to, again, strengthen their capacity, not build capability, strengthen their capacity to be able to... Um, work through these uh, processes and get, um, you know, engage with their people because just another example of them having to go through an exhaustive government process to get access to um, $100,000 or $200,000. We've heard across the state with the, in, the many uh, traditional owners we engage with, over 850, over 30 groups, some of those being non-RAP groups as well, talking about um, funding and accessing grants in the department, and some of them are uh, some of the traditional owner groups are have forty to fifty contracts just with DECA alone. So they're spending a lot of time in responding to government reports and making sure government jump through all they jump through all the hurdles for government, but government don't seem to be jumping through any hurdles to enable our people to be able to realise their cultural rights. Sorry, is that, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I, I totally acknowledge that and, 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 and I, I mean, I cannot but agree with that, um, w which is even m more reason for there to be a system established that, that uh, moves decision making and control uh, from, from, uh, from government and in this case, DECA and, and also myself as Minister uh, to traditional owners. Um, because whilst we control, uh, um, we we have the power, and uh, and that uh, disables traditional owner communities to be able to actually fully shape what self determination should be looking like, and the choices that that need to be made. Um, and and I, again, I point to what uh, we're wanting to achieve uh, in having that longer term community benefit sharing uh, arrangement in place. Uh, and uh, and that is what I, I commit to do because I think that will go some way, some way. I'm not saying that yeah. it's going to be solving everything, but it will go, I think, some way to uh, really coming to terms with this and doing something about it. There's a lot more that's got to be done, uh, obviously beyond that in energy, but also, of course, in resources that need the big catch-up. Uh, but my commitment uh, is to do just that so that we're not having this frustration I mean, well, you, you understand the tension that, you know, this is a more, I guess, a, a newer commodity that, that our people are, um, or, well, I guess society, you know, renewables and so forth is a, is a, is a new sector, uh, maybe been around a while, but certainly exacerbated in the last 15 years. Um, and traditional owners still have so many systematic barriers in place, and yet it's only 
in the last 15 years that this is really ramped up and yet we've got all these barriers before us already so you can understand the tension for traditional owners that they're feeling like they're being shut out of not only historical commodities but also future ones I just wanted to make that point minister thank you can I just say to Minister, would you acknowledge that announcements about future benefits for First Peoples strategies actually benefits have benefit for the state? Uh, I, I think that, um, it, well, yes, um, absolutely, because uh, I, I think when we have a, a healthy community or, or, or everyone... I, I mean that, more the, the launch of the documents themselves oh, and the promises and the commitments that, that are made actually benefit the state, don't they, in they provide access to the high moral ground and oh, I see. look like change is happening. Uh, I, I, Even to change has been made. Yes, and, and, and uh, I'm, I, I know that there have been many documents, many commitments made. Uh, many of them come about because they are interrelated to an original document. Uh, I understand that. And, and ultimately, uh, the proof is going to be in, in showing the evidence and having evidence. Would you agree it's a double injustice when not only have First Peoples been shut out, but then the commitments to make change don't actually eventuate in the time frame that the state has committed and taken the benefit of actually happening? Yes, I agree. It's, it's, we compound the injustice. Yep. And the benefit sharing, the wealth sharing, if it even a big of high moral ground, again, uh, is shifted away from First Peoples to the state. Uh, yes, and I and my intention is to ensure that that community benefit is real, it's tangible, and it is um, one that is controlled by traditional owners. Can I ask you to turn, Minister, to Annexure B? Uh, if we could bring that up on the screen, thank you. Uh, and we've touched on. Sorry, I'll wait till you've got that. Is this supposed to be behind tab ten, Ms. McLeod. Tab, tab eleven. Eleven. Isn't it? Uh, so, Minister, we've touched on the traditional owner renewable energy program and also over the page on the First People's Adoption of Renewable Energy Program and just pausing on this table on the second page, First People's Adoption of Renewable Energy Program, um, it's noted in the column headed Independent Reviews and Feedback, which is the second last column on the right, Due to this being a grant program, no formal review or feedback process has been undertaken of that program, correct? Uh, yes. Um, then we come to Vic Grid on the third page. Uh, now, Vic Grid, as I understand it, coordinates the planning and development of the energy, um, renewable energy zones and modernisation of the energy grid, correct? Yes. Um, it is not, Victoria is not the owner of the electricity transmission system, is it that that's privately owned? That's correct. So in addition to the FPAIR program, under the heading VIC Grid, there's a number of specific programs identified that are intended to support First Peoples' rights and interests in and in connection to country, correct? Uh, yes. So for example, under VIC Grid, we see the top of the page 240,000 0.24 million to Berenji Gadjin Land Council to support engagement uh, concerning the interconnector, the VNI West. Yes. We see 560 odd thousand to Jarabalak Wooka. That's also concerning the uh, interconnector. Yes. And the delivery of 1.3 million to Glawak. What, what's Glawak? Uh, Gunai Kano uh, Land and Water Aboriginal Corporation. Yep. To support their engagement with offshore wind. Um, however, uh, there, there, the, SC, the new SEC has not commenced any program, as I understand it, to support 
First people's rights and interests in connection to country, has it? Uh, n- no, no, it hasn't yet. Uh, it, it's quite embryonic. However, uh, uh, the SEC in its business corporate uh, constitution uh, ha- contains, and also in its 10-year strategy, clear commitments around uh, engagement with traditional owners in terms of projects that, that will be invested in. Okay, I'll come back to what that that uh, participation looks like in a moment, just staying with the numbers and adding up the total amount of funding for programs supporting First Peoples' rights and interests uh, and connection to country, uh, including unallocated grants. It's around $4.162 million, sorry, yes, $4.162 million available from those various grants. Is that I'll be corrected if uh, I'm wrong. Does that sound in uh, the uh, order of magnitude? I take that that's correct, but certainly that's that's the flavour of it. Okay. And when you consider the amount of revenue the Victorian government receives from energy and natural resources, which we've discussed, adds up to more than $1 billion, the amount of self-determination program funding received is comparatively very small. Would you agree? Yes, I, I would. And next should be also refers to a number of broader self-determination frameworks and programs and barriers that exist for full implementation of many of those policies in column four in this document. Uh, and just touching on some of those uh, on page eight, for example, Under the heading, the Papangali Marmanupu, Owning Our Future. Sorry, I've probably savaged that. Self-determination reform strategy on page eight. It's noted overarching barriers include the need for sustainable funding reforms government budget cycles where funding is sought, but budget cuts determine priorities that may not align with traditional owner corporations' needs and aspirations. This extends to the political context and government processes that are system heavy and do not allow for TO contribution. So generally, would you agree that the priorities of traditional owners are sometimes in direct conflict with DECA priorities? Uh, Yes. Pupanyarli Manepu. Uh, is is a commitment around self determination, uh, but certainly there there are sometimes areas where uh, the interests of uh, the department uh, collide with the interests of traditional owner people. Where that happens in a broad sense, DECA prevails, correct? Yes, because that's where the power is. So how do we adjust that? Uh, Create justice and equity. Um, the goalposts have to be shifted, um, and that means that <clears throat> the for traditional owners to seek um, to be able to determine what self determination means and choices, extracting that from a government that itself still holds the decision making and the power, that's got to shift, and and breaking that nexus is vital, um, and therefore it is so important that. Um, the economic independence piece uh, that is an enduring uh, uh, provides an enduring uh, revenue stream for traditional owners will allow enable them to ha- to play on a without one arm tied behind their back, uh, and 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 that is why uh, it is vital that we uh, uh, provide that enable that change through, for example, community benefit program. The, that uh, we will be delivering, uh, and then of course uh, the importance of ensuring that the resources sector we play a very fast catch up there. Oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry. The um, owning our futures sort of determination report that's due to finish next year, and you've got four very big outcomes in there. Uh, like outcome four, for example, is. Well, the old name is accountable and transparent in its efforts to transfer relevant decision making powers and resources to traditional owners and Aboriginal Victorians. You've then got outcome indicators, outcome measures. 
will those four outcomes be achieved by 2025? Uh, I, I think uh, we, we will work as hard as we can to do that. But but, but I will say, though, that uh, I, I realise that it won't be achieved by then. Um, and, and, I, and I also will say that uh, the department is also uh, acknowledging that and there will be a refresh of that document. And I, I know, Commissioner, I love it, you know, your, 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 you know, initial involvement uh, in, in, in the self-determination strategy. Um, we've not done anywhere near, uh, we've not delivered anywhere near what we said we would uh, in that five-year strategy. Um, and we have to try harder, we have to work harder and, and get better outcomes. I'm sorry. Um, just for the record, it's Pupanyali Manmanyepo, which translates to owning our future. I think I always say this, but language is really important. Um, Minister, what's it going to take, um, in your view, around being able to, we're hearing a lot of barriers for traditional owners and Aboriginal Victorians, but Minister, what, what, what's it going to take to, to truly transfer power and resources to enable um, traditional owners um, to... Um, be prosperous to ultimately achieve self determination. What What do you think it's going to take? Uh, ultimately, uh, I, I see treaty or treaties as 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 that really critical, significant turnaround point. However, what we do between now and then, we need to be measured by, uh, and we need to be held accountable for. Uh, what I will say is that. Every single day, we will work. Um, and those issues around resourcing that... Oh, I'm sorry, you were... No, it's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry, Minister, I was not observing there. Um, issues that are raised constantly around resourcing financial, staffing, organisational capacity, competing commitments. Yes. They don't have to wait, do they? No, they don't have to wait, and that is why I qualified. My comments around treaty is that right now we are being asked and expected to deliver on things that look like treaty. Mm. That's what we're going to do. I apologise. Minister, in this document on page 11, there's a reference towards pathway towards Indigenous data sovereignty policy. Uh, yes, yes. This is a precursor to a policy around self-determination, correct? Uh, yes, it is, yes. And commencement of implementation of this pathway has lagged. Correct. So in terms of Indigenous data sovereignty within the department, within your area of responsibility, mm -hmm. we do not even have a pathway to a policy yet. That's correct. Can you um, explain to me, Minister, what has caused the lag? I can say to you, but, it, you know, it won't be um, uh, anywhere near enough for an explanation, but... Um, uh, it, it's it's. I, I think it's not for want of wanting to do one. Um, I, I think that uh, departments uh, and governments generally um, do what they can with the resources that they have. That's not an excuse, and and I make that really clear. Except that's a reality uh, at some points in time. Uh, that's why it's always incumbent on people such as myself as ministers who. Uh, go to budgets every year and go through the sausage machine of budgets and how they're made and what gets uh, allocated um, over the forward estimates, um, that, you know, it's heard loud and clear that uh, that we are behind on certain things and, and we've got to fix that and we've got to move, it, move on. Uh, so other than that, Commissioner, um, they are my genuine sentiments on that. You'd know that under closing the gap, Pillar 4, 
um, and especially with the reading scathing productivity commission review around how those pillars are being implemented that there were recommendations made very clearly around indigenous data sovereignty and indigenous data governance absolutely and and i know that the uh, deca has uh, is, is is turning its mind to um the lack of transparency and and real time sharing of of information and ultimately um whilst uh that, that that's data sovereignty is, is so critical because of it, it is almost um, a response to the dispossession uh and 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 having control uh and and ownership of what is yours and that has been taken away is 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 absolutely essential to be delivered um if one of those essential elements is empowered genuine participation by first nations people in the pathway towards sovereignty. Yes. And we just look for a moment at what the current state of affairs is in terms of that participation. The department currently employs two employees to undertake assessment of mineral quarry and petroleum tenements against the future acts regime of of the Native Title and Toss Act, you f familiar with that number? Uh, yes. And you've listed, or the department has listed, the grants programs, the extent of the grants programs currently available to them, assuming they have secured wraps. Correct. Yes. Only Glawak and Jarra have land use Aboriginal agreements at the moment. Is that correct? Uh, correct. That number sufficient, Minister, in terms of internal employees? Uh, no. Uh, and... Uh, the tracking uh, of, of DECA towards uh, the employment commitment as a minimum. I think we, it's at 3%, I believe, though. We're, we're not not near to achieving that, no. But certainly in resources, that is a very small number. I want to jump for a moment, unless commissioners have other questions about that, and next year to action on climate change, if I may. Mm -hmm. And... Um, The state and Commonwealth both have responsibility for delivering action on climate change, correct? That's correct, yes. Minister, I take it you would accept that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change sixth synthesis report, the sixth assessment report delivered in March last year, is the authoritative statement of climate change impacts globally and an important guide for um, government to determine action. Absolutely, and the urgency is only increasing. I take it you would accept that the IPCC report, AR6, states that the world is on track for catastrophic climate changes by the end of the century, representing a catastrophic threat to human wellbeing and planetary health. Yes. In Australia, those risks are known, well known and well understood. And in a broad sense, uh, do you accept that global warming and the impacts of global warming have a particularly severe impact on First Nations peoples across the country? More so than any other peoples, yes. Um, you'd be familiar with the Commonwealth First Annual Statement on Climate Change, which acknowledged that fact? Yes. The Climate Change Minister, the Commonwealth Climate Change Minister, noted in that statement, First Nations people are disproportionately affected by climate change because of their relationship to the environment and to country. Climate impacts can threaten cultural knowledge, heritage, traditional practices, and potentially further displace First Nations people from their homes and affect their ability to access country. 
This includes a loss of access to traditional lands, waters and natural resources that he said could only be described as catastrophic. The loss of ancestral, spiritual, totemic and language connections to land and associated areas has major implications for the human rights of affected peoples as well as their physical and mental well-being. Extreme events are also contributing to the damage of First Nations places and cultural sites. So I take it you would agree with those comments by the Commonwealth Minister? Yes, I do. Turning to action on climate, you would agree, Minister, that climate change will likely have a significant impact on country? Absolutely, and it is now. And in your witness statement at paragraph 73, you state that the Victorian government has provided $1.1 million in grants to assist traditional owners to initiate their own responses to climate change and that the grants are for 11 traditional owner corporations. Sorry, I'll wait till you get that up. I'm sorry, Can you? what was the number of these? 73, it's up on the screen if you oh, need thank it. Thank you. So 1.1 million in grants to assist traditional owners to initiate their own responses to climate change and that the grants are for 11 traditional owner corporations to build their capacity to care for country and meet a variety of on-the-ground needs. So does that mean that to date, the Victorian government has given each of the 11 traditional owner corporations $100,000 to respond to climate change? Through that fund, yes. And is that the the totality of the contribution to traditional owner corporations in terms of the response to climate change? Yes. So 100000 as we understand it, would pay for, let's say, an average salary for one public servant in 2017, seven years ago. My question is, how can 100000 meaningfully enable a traditional owner corporation to respond to climate change? It can't. There is no other funding at this time to enable them to meaningfully respond to climate change. That's correct. There is no... Yep, sorry. Is that the the same dollars we were talking about earlier? Different dollars, Commissioner. There's only 100,000 for traditional owner groups to respond to the decimation of their country from what colonisation and and the state have done and, and private as well. Yes. Why? Uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, I, I can say to you, uh, I personally have sought for the funds uh, and not achieved those, but that's that's not the answer. Um, it's an explanation, but of what, why we are here, um, but it's nowhere. It, it, it's 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 nowhere near enough. It's it's an acknowledgement, uh, and that is all that it is really. I just don't understand how. Can respond to that with a hundred thousand, given given the fact of exactly what I said before. That and and um, councillors said, you know, it's catastrophic. Said, and we have this small amount in a bucket to respond when it's actually going to disconnect us even further from country. I'm just baffled at the. Millions of dollars we've previously spoken about, and then a hundred thousand, which probably they have to do. They have to apply for this, or is it just? Uh, th- there is an application process, although I believe the um, the uh, the statewide. Um, I'm sorry, the forum. Uh, apologies. Uh, the uh, statewide caring for country partnership forum minister. Thank you. I yep. apologise, Commissioner. I love it. Uh, th- were engaged to provide guidance around its criteria, but that, that's the extent of it. The only other thing I would offer, perhaps, Commissioner, if I may, I, I can't speak on behalf of the water portfolio, but I know that there's been some some more a value much greater than one point one million that have gone towards that. But but I, but I understand your point, and I'm not trying to distract from no. your your the. The, the veracity and, and the validity of well, even if it is water, then they have to apply for that separately as well. Another. I, I, I think there may be allocations or rights around that, but but I don't profess to know the details. I apologise, but I'm able to. We're able to find further info, but but I, I take your point that 
this is just it doesn't go anywhere near where, where it needs to go. I did say in your, I think, something to the words of when country's healthy, our people are healthy. How do we keep healthy when we can't even, we get 100,000 to write a stra- decimated lands? Oh, sorry, I'm struggling with this in my in my head, so I'm just trying to get some answers around how it says keeping with self-determination principles. What? Can I ask what are the self-determination principles? Uh, well, um, for me, what, uh, what well, my understanding under, of it under is... Under your portfolio, what are they? Yeah, well, uh, they are about uh, uh, empowering, shifting power from uh, where it is now, people like myself and departments and governments, to First Peoples, to traditional owners, uh, and the resources they need to be able to do something with that power. Uh, that that is for me. That is what it is. But it's it's about then being able for them to make the choices about what their future should look like and and can be to determine that for themselves. So, do you believe that's happening under your portfolios, uh, or has been happening? Because we, we've been inching towards it, uh, but we've not achieved it, and and we're nowhere near achieving it. Thank you. Yeah, um, Minister. The last couple of um, uh, funding, uh, so renewable energy fu- energy funding, it was a uh, hundred thousand dollars. This fund is a hundred thousand dollars directly targeted to registered Aboriginal parties. Now we've heard loud and clear from our our mob that that's you know hard fought gains that they have to go through, but also it's a very broken colonial system that makes our people and trades our people off against each other. Um, we haven't heard much today, Minister, about the non recognised in a colonial context, um, Aboriginal groups who are traditional owners, uh, is any work happening in these two streams or more broadly in the department with um, making sure that all our people are not even falling further behind? Uh, th- thank you. Yes, and, and, and I acknowledge that there are many um, traditional owners who are still aspire and, and, and have yet to achieve uh, formal recognition mm-hmm. under us. Um, I, I know that uh, Deka uh, 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 takes steps to engage with uh, uh, non-formally recognised um, traditional owners, um, but uh, we, we it, it's again we are behind on that also. Um, so that that's the extent that I can answer that, Commissioner, truthfully. Minister, does the state fund other bodies other than traditional owners for climate change advocacy? Yes, uh, yes, it does. Uh, we, we there was a period of time where um, and and these funds and these programs are no longer active. And the funds have been expended. Um, uh, where we had community climate. Run a, a program, and and I and I think from memory, and I'll double check this that I think the action on climate allocation of funds derived from that broader program. Uh, so there have been uh, whether there are any that are remain active in terms of non uh, Indigenous organisations receiving funds. Mm-hmm. I don't believe so. If they are, they're at the point of still undertaking the pro- the the particular. Uh, activities that they've been funded for. And do you know um, amounts were expended on them and, and what organisations um, received that funding? Uh, if I may, Commissioner, I'll attempt to see if I have that in my file off the top of my head. I don't know. If I can't locate it, I commit to making sure that I bring back that information. Mm-hmm. Is that okay if I can do that? So just uh, one other point about the um, – I met a little bit earlier around the grants and traditional owners having to apply. Can we get any commitment from you here today about um, making sure under your authority as a minister directing the, the department around streamlining some of those funding agreements and making it easier for traditional owners to access um, these grants in the future? I, I commit to that, Commissioner, yes. You agree to doing that? I agree, yes, to doing just that. Okay. Um, so, 
Um, Minister, I want to bring you to the latter part of your witness statement just to finish up here with some broad questions. In your witness statement, you discuss the Victorian transmission investment framework reforms and offshore wind sector and some areas of reform. So can I ask you these questions broadly? Um, in terms of transmission, the transmission projects, <clears throat> Is the intention to avoid um, is the intention to avoid new areas of land where traditional owners raise concerns about exclusion? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you just say? Yep. I'll, I'll, I'll reframe it. Yep. Perhaps try to abbreviate it too quickly. The transmission networks process should identify areas of land where there are culturally heritage uh, cultural areas of cultural sensitivity or significance that's a key input into the choice of uh, lands for the development of the new transmission network correct yes absolutely and are there any guarantees to ensure that cultural heritage will not be impacted by the development of the transmission network or is that just an input that can be overridden. No, it, it it won't be just an input. I mean, the, what 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 uh, the Victorian Transmission Investment Framework reforms include is, if you like, up um, front ending uh, a lot of the investigations of an appreciation of all of the values that people ascribe to a potential route for a transmission uh, infrastructure. Um, pathway, a, a reserve, if you like, easement, um, whether it's non-traditional communities or others, uh, farming land and the rest, understanding what those in, in, for the respect, in respect of uh, traditional owners, um, us understanding early on what those cultural values are and spiritual values is important to inform uh, ultimately decisions that need to be made around where the ultimate route is of of a of a transmission infrastructure uh, project, so uh, it is intended to be meaningful to that degree. Uh, so the, the, it also includes um, geospatial data inputs, and again, I know that the question is not just about an input, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, the VicGrid is uh, spent uh, is is investing a lot of effort actually make sure that we flush out uh, all of the values and in, in particular traditional owned values so that uh, we hold ourselves to account for ultimately decisions that are made that need to be made around what is the ult the final route of a transmission uh, project, for example. Is there an intention to financially compensate traditional owners for transmission projects that traverse their lands? Uh, what yes, so if I may describe uh, it in uh, two parts, because you mentioned the word compensation, in 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 a legislative sense, in terms of compensation that is recognised legally for the purposes of um, the crown coming onto uh, land, there is a compensation regime that exists in uh, one of the land acts. I apologise for that. I will I'll find that out for you. Uh, that is directly compensation, and effectively it applies to farming communities. I don't believe it extends to traditional owners, but I will get that confirmed, if I may. Uh, what the intention of the government is, and my, myself, is that um, uh, we will uh, change uh, the understanding of, of th what we will be seeking to do is two things. One is create that uh, community benefit sharing framework uh, that will afford traditional owners uh, of lands that these projects are built on uh, a right to a particular revenue stream. Um, that will also apply to uh, the, the renewable energy zones that our government will be responsible to uh, determine and any new renewable energy projects that are built. Again, that will be looked at equally and treated equally. Um, so, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I've totally answered that question, but if I've left something out, please let me know. Will you go on to talk about the offshore wind sector and the, um, the Glowak, um publications? 
Do you agree in the broad that traditional owners should be able to realise economic investment and passive income opportunities in renewable energy? Yes, absolutely. Uh, If I may just point to, uh, and you mentioned offshore wind, uh, the the government has has, um, released um, three what we call offshore wind energy implementation statements, and they are uh, an iterative document, if you like, about the steps that we are taking over a period of time towards getting to the first uh, offshore renewable energy projects uh, delivered. Uh, the the last implementation statement, uh, there was a, a very uh, clear uh, statement made in terms of the intention of government, uh, which will be factored into our tender process for the first offshore wind energy mm-hmm. projects, that we would expect that proponents that wish to participate in a tender process that will be opening up uh, in the next few months, uh, that they will need to come forward having uh, determined and struck agreements with the relevant traditional owner communities in terms of what benefit sharing they wish to achieve from that proponent if they were to go ahead to uh, build a project. That is separate. That is a separate expectation and requirement that we will have through our tender process, separate to the other architecture I've been talking quite a bit about, that community benefit share in which we will um, develop up as a framework. They, they are two separate and that one does not cancel the other out. Um, so I take it from that that the Victorian government supports benefit sharing arrangements such as revenue streams from renewable energy projects? Yes, definitely. And we are actively, uh, our intent is to actively uh, establish those. Um, there wasn't anything I wanted to ask, particularly about the resources sector, but um, commissioners may have questions in relation to those paragraphs of reform uh, and the way forward. Can I ask you this question broadly? Do you, is it your view? that First Nations people should have the authority to decide who and how resources are extracted from their lands and the terms on which they should they do so? That's a hard question to answer. Yes, I, I, I agree. How we achieve that um, is one that is, is must be worked on. Um, Because your question was about should they, uh, sorry, who, decide, is that correct? Should they sorry, have I'll the authority? i to make sure I answer the question. Should they have the authority to decide who and how resources are extracted, who may and and how resources are extracted from their lands? So, so that that is something that I imagine uh, will be determined through a treaty process. Um, I, I, I can... Uh, understand and accept that traditional owners would want to seek that. Um, uh, I have a personal view on that. I, I, I don't believe the government has made any, I don't believe, has made any public statements uh, to support that. Um, I take it your personal view would be to support that. Well, I, I think I, I could certainly say that. Yep. Yes. And how do we, how do we, create the wherewithal for First Nations people to ask for that and know what to ask for in the treaty process? Well, uh, a lot has to happen between now and, and I mean, I know treaty process is one that is determined uh, and, and there is a pathway there. Um, what, what needs to happen, uh, a, a lot of building blocks need to be put and set so that uh, traditional owners can be on the best in the best position possible to um, extract a treaty and or treaties uh, from government on behalf of the, the all of people of Victoria uh, to the best way that helps them to achieve self determination. Um, what those building blocks look like, a lot of it will be about uh, the system we're going through right now. You know, the part of truth telling and and just having the facts and and having the facts for everyone to know and understand. Uh, and and to be very clear about the harms uh, that have been caused but continue to be 
perpetuated uh, and, uh, and, and what those building blocks look like are ones that uh, we will need to take guidance from traditional owners. Uh, There's clearly an information asymmetry here that it requires a truth-telling commission to extract this information. Do you commit to providing updates to this information when it comes to treaty negotiations? Absolutely. Minister, um, there was a this, um, criticism about the declaration of the Southern Ocean and offshore wind zone. Yes. And the crux of the criticism was a failure by government to consult Gunditjmara people. So can you explain what the position was in relation to that? Uh, yes, th thank you. Um, uh, the, the the nature of where offshore wind energy will be built uh, is in Commonwealth waters, where the actual wind farms will be situated. Uh, hence, not just because of that, because there are also environmental and biodiversity approvals frameworks that need to be um, uh, satisfied. Uh, hence, there are uh, a, a number of uh, areas where uh, state and Commonwealth permission and, and, and processing uh, uh, is, is required. I, I am fully aware that for the Southern Ocean uh, uh, offshore wind energy zone uh, that the Commonwealth has uh, announced, uh, they had a, a consultation process. Uh, that consultation process uh, heard from uh, many communities, including, of course, Eastern Nam, and uh, uh, people and uh, who were very clear that they uh, were disappointed and uh, opposed um, to the process undertaken and have been very clear about the fact that they do not accept the outcome. Um, I understand that uh, there were two key areas of disappointment. One is the process undertaken and we can all do processes better, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it still it satisfies uh, the concerns raised. Um, so, and and I personally made representations to the Commonwealth uh, seeking for a better approach uh, and a better way to listen uh, and and better appreciate uh, traditional owner community views on it. Um, however. The, the, the fact remains uh, that uh, both Eastern Ma and the Gunditjmara uh, peoples uh, remain uh, very much opposed uh, to offshore wind energy, primarily not only because of the spiritual uh, values uh, of sea country, uh, in particular uh, Dean Ma, uh, and that remains... Um, a very, very, uh, I will say, from a, a perspective of a, myself as a minister, um, a very, very difficult matter to to work through. Um, so I'm hoping that that goes. Myanmar was excised, wasn't it, from the? It was. So, but it seems almost incredible, knowing the significance of the island, that it was ever included. It wasn't it. Uh, I think uh, there were um, th there were conversations had between Dick and the Commonwealth Department very early on in the uh, the, the first, if you like, drafting of the uh, zone to be declared by the Commonwealth. Uh, but through that, and I and I, I accept what you're saying that that should have been unknown at the beginning. I think uh, it was part of the native title determination. Uh, I believe so. Yes. Uh, and and, uh, and there is a, also, I think, a, a, another um, uh, Commonwealth architecture around sea country also that that offended. So um, certainly, and I think that's where it, administratively uh, that there were many missteps taken from day one around that uh, that should not have occurred, notwithstanding the fact that it remains um, an area of... of uh, Deep concern to the traditional and the communities. Was that the first declaration of a um, 
a wind zone? Uh, no, in fact, Commissioner, the the first uh, the first declaration of, of an offshore wind energy zone by the Commonwealth was uh, the offshore Gippsland region. Mm -hmm. uh, there we have, uh, uh, if you like, a, a we have uh, a, a different um, uh, sentiment uh, of the Gunai Kunai uh, people, the corporation there, uh, regarding uh, for their own reasons, good reasons, they 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 see offshore wind energy potentially through uh, an economic wealth sharing opportunity, uh, and we have uh, Glawak that is uh, working uh, very strongly for, for their own purposes to achieve uh, the economic values that they wish to achieve uh, through offshore wind development on the Gippsland side. So that was the first one. The second one was uh, renewable energy offshore in New, New, uh, New South Wales, and the third one, I think, is, or the fourth one, is this one here, Southern Ocean. Minister, do you make commitments to continually raise with the federal government what you're hearing directly from traditional owners? Uh, yes. Uh, there will be opportunities but also barriers around what their needs and wants are, particularly when they're opposing? Uh, yes, absolutely, uh, Commissioner. I, I will say to you that uh, d during that, that period uh, uh, of in uh, a manner of engagement, the Commonwealth undertook uh, with traditional owners uh, around the oh. Southern Oceans, um, draft zone, uh, uh, DECA uh, very much took a really front-footed approach to engaging with the Commonwealth Department and, and really offering them advice and, and what we were hearing from traditional owners uh, and, and, and to the point of offering advice about this is how you can do it better. We don't do it perfectly, but what you're doing is is not working and it's actually causing more harm and more distress um i uh i've been always very keen around offshore wind energy for us to strike a formal arrangement with the commonwealth um uh to have a, a better integrated uh approach between at least the two departments commonwealth and and, and state around how we develop up this industry and that would also have included, you know, a, a, a much a much more healthy and responsive approach uh, to the needs of traditional communities. And any opportunities for future community benefits as well? Should the traditional owners want that? Exactly. That's absolutely correct, yes. I mean, so we talk a lot today about country, really, our country. Um, are you a proud Victorian minister, would you say? In a lot of ways, I'm a bit of an internationalist, but anyway, we'll put that aside. Yep. But yes, I am a proud Victorian. And, and and can you articulate to people here listening in or in the room here, how important is Aboriginal cultural heritage to all Victorians? Um, I think it, it is absolutely, for, for those of us who realise and acknowledge that it is important to those that possibly yet are awakening to it and hopefully those that eventually will come uh, along to uh, except in this, you know, we, we can't be proud uh, of, of a state uh, where the damage that has been done and continues to uh, be done, uh, the legacies of that in the face of a very resilient community, uh, set of communities, we can't really be proud at all um, without uh, this truth-telling process uh, healing is something for traditional owner communities to judge whether they can achieve that and hopefully get to it. But reparation, uh, that, that's when we'll be. Yeah, I mean, we've heard some, um, thanks, Minister. We've heard from uh, some evidence from Uncle Robbie Thorpe, you know, who described, you know, our culture, our practices, our language, you know, is a true gift to the nation. You know, we, we contribute a lot, but we always have wanting to share and um, and contribute and, and, and wanting people to embrace our culture, embrace us as a people, um, rather than to go to my point earlier around regulating us and, and making us further impoverished in, in poverty and the justice system and the child protection system and so forth. So, you know, I guess it's just, you know, we're always seen as a barrier or a blocker or so forth as well. But, you know, all, all we've always wanted to do 
is contribute, and our people have always fought for equality. That's what our elders have always fought for, equal, to be equal in society, equality. I'll just want to ask a question. I don't want to open something up, but my um, question is, do you think you have the right model within the public service to do the business we need to do now? Because clearly, since treaties on the table, we've moved beyond Aboriginal affairs being a welfare issue or a service delivery program. We're moving into a totally different space. Do you think departments are structured with, uh, with the right kinds of structures to move into this next space where we're talking um, reparations, sharing country and sharing things culturally, and which we've always done, as uh, Commissioner Lovett's just mentioned, but going beyond and working together in a way that we haven't before. Because if it's a service delivery model, we're still in the welfare headspace and that won't, nothing will change if people have got that attitude. And we were sort of impressed at the beginning of the commission when all of the people that belong to the Victorian Aboriginal Affairs Framework came along with their teams and their departments, you know, up to 20 teams with the, you know, with the uh, 20 members of the team with the police, thinking, oh, here's a whole lot of, you know, people that can help us. Yeah. But if they continue on in the same program style, we're not going to have a change at all. And that's what we're grappling with, I think, a little bit today about how how there's got to be a shift in the delivery of what we're expecting. And it's got to come halfway at least to us, not us go all the way just because we're a minority. And I, I just question that about in terms of people that are continue to be employed in that space and in the future, that there is a thinking about the changes that are needed. It's a statement, statement more than a but I do quest, make that a question about staffing in the future, yeah. truly. Th th thank you. And um, uh, uh, I, I totally agree that um, that uh, the structure of DCAP and all departments uh, uh, must be reshaped uh, to embed, uh, to embed uh, self-determination. Uh, uh, sorry. What I meant by that, to, to enable self-determination by traditional owner communities. The, the one important way and a vital way is that the representation among staff uh, of traditional owners is, 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 is vital for us to achieve that. Uh, we have set targets, certainly, you know, of, of employing a certain number of people. We have, what, 5,700-odd people in DECA. We've got a target of 3%, and I think we're around 2.2%. Uh, no, less than that, I think. Uh, and we've got um, and and we've got a long way to go. We've not done in anywhere near enough because when you include people within the departmental structures, that's when you start to get real cultural change. And cultural change and attitude and change is ultimately uh, we're at the start of that, uh, and and a lot more needs to be done to get to that. Um, so I, I acknowledge that because. Otherwise, we remain in a, a relationship where it's a controlling relationship, uh, and often it's the controller who does the harm, and it's the same controller who says, "Oh, here, I'll give you a hand, and here's a bit of welfare, and here's a bit of, you know, uh, something that makes you feel better." That's we, that's got to be broken open and replaced. Thank you, commissioners. That is the evidence of the minister. Is that a convenient time for a break? We um, are due to resume at 3.30. Yes. Well, the next break. panel is an extended lunch break. break. A couple more questions. Oh, yeah, I'm okay. sorry, Commissioner. Um, Minister, what does a shared future look like in your view? So you've talked about treaty today. You talked about hand, um, hand transferring power and resources, sorry. Um, what does a shared future look like? Uh, a, a shared future uh, is one where... Uh, traditional owner communities uh, can finally have uh, recognised not just an attachment to land because 
Some have that, others don't. So we need to, that business needs to be finished. Uh, but that have control in terms of the, 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 that reconnection fully uh, to to land and whether it's land country, sea country, uh, the spiritual connection um, and the choices. Uh, ultimately, I think it, it, it needs to be, can only be demonstrated once we achieve uh, a point in time where traditional owners actually have that free choice to determine what their future looks like. And it's one that has to close a lot of gaps, close a lot of gaps and make a lot of amends. That's when we'll have a truly shared future. Uh, Minister, as well, we had uh, Minister for Treaty and First Peoples come before us uh, and we heard a lot about time constraints and we asked a lot of questions about time constraints and heard a lot of barriers to time. But another thing that came up that resonated for me was leadership. What kind of what leadership will you demonstrate now and into the future to ensure self determination, whether it be through the treaty process or just enabling self determination to happen? What leadership will you um, demonstrate? First critical one is listening, uh, listening, acknowledging, and 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 informing the decision making that I have the privilege to hold. Uh, and 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 I need and that needs to be done in in everything, if, all the choices that I have the privilege of holding within my portfolios. But leadership is also about not settling for what you can get. Uh, it's about what what is that gap, and and how do we how do we not take how do I not take. Uh, what is on offer as 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 the only thing to strive for? Uh, it's about building on that, um, but also doing it in a public way. Certainly, I I, I can do that within a department, I, I, and I do do that, and I will strive to do more within government, uh, within the parameters of cabinet confidentiality. I, I commit to doing that uh, because if we don't if we don't hold and appreciate the ambition that traditional owners have, knowing that we still have the power to turn that on or off, sadly, we still do, then very little is going to change. So it's a requirement on me that I put on myself uh, to not only, it's it's about opening that door and then empowering traditional owners to be able to uh, take power and resources ultimately to, to, do, to be able to make the choices for yourself. But, but but we need to do that publicly too because people do look to leaders and there are many leaders across all walks of life, you know. Um, there's the, the parent who will stand up and say something about what the school's doing that that's not right, for example. Or we can all think of leaders and families and in paid jobs and in volunteer organisations. Um, I want to try to set an example, whether it's within my portfolios but also as a better citizen. And, and touching upon that, um, what drives you to be successful? Ah, um, I think it's for others to determine that, but I, I, I choose to judge. What drives me to be successful is whether success can be seen in the eyes of other people for themselves. Just to maybe finally can this that. There's been an unfortunate, fairly common theme in a lot of the evidence of um, very laudable and genuine statements of intent to do things better. Um, but do you accept that there is a real urgency about doing that, that maybe this commission has thrown a light on? Yes, absolutely. Um, and it's quite um, starkly evident in uh, the state of the, the natural environment and the harms that have been done to the natural environment and how the job has been made all the more harder by past wrongs and Im impact on climate uh, and disposition. Things are just getting harder and, 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 and the impacts are getting Harder. So the urgency is it needs to be 
surpass that so that we actually start to pull back and and back, absolutely. I'm thinking more of the impact on Indigenous people, which has become very evident sitting here, that this is not a historical thing. This is today and now and this evening. We're sitting down having dinner. There are others sitting down having dinner on whom these issues impact daily. Yes. And I'm I'm not sure whether that urgency is really understood when grand policy statements are made. I mean, of course, it's laudable that there are commitments made, but I wonder to what extent, and I'm asking whether in your case you understand that that's against a background of urgency. Uh, I do understand that, but can I just say that uh, here today, I understand that far better, uh, absolutely, and uh, and it's it 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 it's becoming thus only because we failed for so long and have been very slow uh, in coming to terms with the last two hundred odd years, Minister. Um... You got quite emotional several times today. Um, do you want to give some sentiment out there about what, why you're so emotional today in in, in coming before the commission, but also um, just in some of your responses? I think it'd be important to you know to hear from you on that. Uh, Commissioner, you're going to challenge me now. I think oh, it's wrong. Mm. What has happened is absolutely wrong. We all have to take responsibility for it and fix it. Mm. It's what being human is. That's the most I think you'll be able to get out of me without really breaking me. I'm sorry. Thanks, Minister. Minister. Thank you, Minister. It remains to thank the Minister for her time this morning and for her evidence and to resume at 3.30 this afternoon. So we'll take a break till 3.30.